ahead and uh, call this meeting to order on Wednesday, June 10th. Um, and I'll just jump right into um, new business. If other people join us on the call, I will let you know who is on the call and in the room with us virtually. Uh, right now, it's just Deb Dunlap is with us virtually, so I just wanted to, I'll keep you all surprised of that as it changes. So under new business, uh, Robert is with us this evening because we do have the ratification of DPW seasonal staff. As you know, this is a topic of uh, conversation last Wednesday, and we had appointed three seasonals last Wednesday to help with the work. Um, and I believe we have in front of us one seasonal, is that correct? So Robert, if you want to talk a little bit about that. So we uh, we have one seasonal right now that we're ready to hire and, uh, and interviewed um, by a parks woman, uh, Steve. And they, they feel that he is a good uh, candidate. Uh, he's not a return candidate from previous seasons, so um, we're a little bit uh, you know, aware of that, but he's, he's ready to go. We do have another one that we are considering uh, right now, but they're still in the process. So this would be the fourth season that we have now. And uh, I think you mentioned that there's a budget for five, no more than five seasons to get us through the work, and that is also what the staff has said would help to, to do the work. So I will read the letter that is before us. Um, Dear Chairman Hoyt, this letter is to advise the Board of Selectmen that subject to the Board's ratification as provided in Section 10 of the Town Charter, I have appointed Marcus Leak, Leak, is that how I say it? Okay. To the position of seasonal laborer for the Department of Public Works. Mr. Leak will work to support the DPW to provide vegetation management and other services to the Town of Adams. Upon your ratification and the passing of all hiring requirements, Mr. Leak will begin this position effective June 11, 2020, at the DPW seasonal labor rate of $12.75 per hour. Any questions for a motion? I make a motion. We ratify Marcus Leak, your position of seasonal labor for the Department of Public Works, at a rate of $12.75 an hour effective June 11, 2020. I have a motion by Jim. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a second by Rick. Any discussion? Uh, just a question. Um, I, I think that I read um, um, Steve Strachey. This is an Adams resident. Yes. And how old is he? I don't know his exact age, but he's over 18. Okay, so he's a younger guy, in other words. Yes. Okay. I don't think we can actually ask that. In an interview, right? We can ask them. Do they? Have, they don't put it on the application, do they? I think they fill out their birth date after the fact. That's probably why we wouldn't know. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Or an abstention? That is unanimous. Robert, you're still with us. So I will let you talk to us about the um, wastewater treatment plant operator one um, on our agendas. It is to ratify the appointment of Brian Marco, but maybe you want to walk us through that. Yeah, uh, so our wastewater treatment plant um, has a requirement for seven staff members. Um, it's a requirement that we have to that. And we've had some bad luck there. We, we actually lost a staff member not too long ago that, that actually uh, deceased and passed away. And that complicated thing. We also had a staff member over there who was basically um, on medical leave for an extensive period of time. So we've been down the two, two men now. So um, this will get us back to that level. And as you remember, we hired a, a, a prior staff member a couple of months ago. This will bring us up to full uh, capacity at the waste uh, water treatment plant. And this is the uh, operator of one position. Thank you. <laughs> I will try to hold on to the piece of this paper a little bit more. <laughs> okay, thank you, Robert. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so the letter that is in our packet, uh, dear Chairman Hoyt, this letter is to advise the Board of Selectmen that subject to the Board's ratification is provided in Section 10 of the Town Charter. Brian Marco has been appointed to the position of Operator 1 for the wastewater treatment plant. Mr. Marco has extensive experience in electrical and mechanical skills that has made him the best qualified candidate for the Operator 1 position at the wastewater treatment plant. He will be acquiring all necessary licenses and will begin this position effective June 11, 2020 at the wastewater D12 step one rate of $18.30 per hour upon successful completion of all hiring requirements. Respectfully submitted by Jay Green, Town Administrator. What is the board's pleasure? I'll make a motion to ratify the appointment of Brian Marco in position of operator one for the wastewater treatment plant. I have a motion by Rick. Do I have a second? Second. A second by Jim. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Or an abstention? That is unanimous. All right. Thank you, Robert. Um, in your packet, you have a copy of um, Forest Park Full Outdoor Dining Application. Um, that is not what is to be uh, looked at by this board as we gave that authority to um, inspectional services. However, the last page of your packet is the temporary license um, for their alcohol. And that is what is before us. And it looks like this. It should be the very last page. Um, however, you can see what the nice example of what they're completing for the dining application and how that process has moved forward. Um, they have already been inspected um, and are operating with food service um, for that. However, the temporary license here in front of us is, uh, it was brought to our attention that their current license does not cover uh, the porch. They have alcohol, so for them to have full outdoor um, dining that they wish to have. Um, they would like to amend their liquor license to uh, include the covered porch. So I'll draw your attention to the center part of the temporary license paper um, where it talks about the description of outdoor premises and it talks about the covered porch on the attached diagram uh, for maximum capacity of 39 people and that there would not be any heating on the grass. So this is to cover their alcohol um, consumption on the porch. And again, as we talked about on Monday, this would be through November 1st, or it expires on November 1st, per the state guidance that was provided to us. This is a local licensing authority decision. It does not need to go forward to the from here, we just need to notify that the ABCC that we uh, amended their license if that is the board's pleasure this evening. Uh, if the club would like to go forward with the full process, we will certainly help them to do that to amend their license going forward. But this is for their dining option. So what is before us is to approve the amended liquor license to include outdoor service for Forest Park Country Club. Now, the diagram indicates, I think you indicated that it was just for porch. Correct. That walked off lawn as... So they submitted this as their plan. Right. It was inspected. Right. And inspectional services told them that they would not be able to use the lawn, that okay. they would only be able to use the porch. Yes. And so that is why their capacity was reduced. Um, because I think they initially put in that their capacity would be 55, and it was reduced to 39 per inspectional services. And so the porch would just have alcohol. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, how did this come about? I mean, I I don't drink, but I've gone up to country club before, and I mean people been drinking on their porch for a hundred years. So we're going to find that there's quite a few of our businesses who have expanded to outdoor consumption um, over the last several decades and the paperwork 
doesn't reflect that. Okay. So this will be a time where we can actually clean up that paperwork. This is one of those um, cases. Uh, how, did, how did it originally come to the forefront that uh, they didn't have that particular uh, license to uh, drink on the porch? How did that come forward and how did we hear about that? Sure, so last week when um, we knew that the restaurant uh, we're going to be able to open for outdoor seating. We started to pull all of the licenses and all of um, the permits that our restaurants have to start looking at what they have and to start thinking of creatively. Um, and it was brought forward by staff that there are a couple of places that currently their license does not cover outdoor. Um, and, and this is one of them. So we did notify Forest Park to get their paperwork in order um, when they submitted this, and we are notifying the others as well. So we will see a number of these in the next couple of days, and we will work with them to get it permanently corrected um, as we go forward. But it's just, it's decades. It's, I guess it's just been going on. Yeah, I know. I was surprised too. Golf more tournaments up there. I was surprised too. So this is a good time to correct any paperwork that needs corrected. They're good for, they're good until November 1st under this action tonight. But in order for them to continue beyond that, they have to apply for a permanent amendment at some point. Right. Excuse me, our first candidate here. Okay. Now, the, 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 at our last meeting, Okay. If they apply for a permanent license next year, that does not apply. The, the fees being waived does not correct. apply. Correct. Correct. This amendment. Just for this right here, November first. Yes. Yep. And they may hold off on <coughs> the um, permanent paperwork because of change of officers and so forth, and that paperwork that they would have to do. They would. They're in a position where I think they would have several amendments to their license because they're a club and they have to submit the officer stuff and um, they have a change of a, uh, manager application. Do, they say, do they have a manager up there now? Yes, they do have a manager and they are working on their change of manager application as well. So, do you want to apply for this? It uh, is. Is Yeah, this is the, the club that has applied for this. He's a club officer. Is he the bar manager? No, the bar manager is Chad Elbover with Bruce Carden still helping me name. Okay. That is one thing that they're cleaning up. Yep. Right. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, amendment to liquor license to include outdoor service for Forest Park Country Club at 41 Forest Park. I have a motion by Rick. I have a, I have a second by Jim. Any other questions or discussion? Just a question sure, regarding yeah. to hours of operation. Yep. Uh, that says it's at midnight. Well, normally, when the rules are followed, everyone in our establishments, you know, Bonnie Ferris outside, um, you know, being in the Forest Park, I'm not going to cause a problem with. Uh, any loud noise uh, that happens on the shelf like that is for buying out. This is midnight here, and then you have the Bali Fair, and I can talk to trouble with neighbors. I don't know if there's any other area. So, so midnight, is that something, because this is, this is kind of new because it's outside. Right. Is that going to cause any concern with neighbors because people are all on, let's say, for example, as far as back 1130. Having a good time, having to the tables, a little loud. We got a 10 o'clock uh, noise uh, ordinance here in town. So I'm just curious, you know, for me, I, probably the area is not going to be a problem there. We're going to keep it under control. Uh, body fair is probably not have much problem at all. I don't know who else has food other uh, than I'll figure out some day closer to the game. So that's just a question I have. Maybe something to think about going forward. Sure. Okay. But otherwise, I'm not fine. Okay. I will ask I will ask inspectional services to take a look at that because um, that's on the application that they are approving. Um, on this time, yeah, go ahead, Jay. From a legal standpoint, all the action that the board does is amend 
the scope of the premise where it can deliver the, the alcohol service. Yeah. So technically speaking, they should already be permitted on their existing permit for a service in the eye. In a perfect world, without the correction that we have to make, they have technically been serving outside until that original time on their their liquor license. That's the problem when you have what is an antique license, essentially. And now that we're looking at it, as we've stated, now all these other issues are starting to creep up. So if, for example, on their original license, it said you can serve until 1130 p.m., your actions can only authorize those outdoor sales until 1130, because you're not modifying the serving hours. You're only modifying where they can serve the liquor. So to answer John's question, it would be what is on their, their term, which must be which must be done. And to our point earlier, if they've been doing it historically, one would assume there's no claim. But that is a likely scenario that we're going to have with new new service at new locations and premises that haven't haven't served before outdoors. So it's definitely a valid point. But this one is is odd in the sense that, as Joe said, they have been doing it. Forever. In fact, I think the original, someone told me if they thought the original license was 1920. Yes. Yeah. It's a good trial period, too. Because it expires in November. So, yeah. now we, we get a bunch of issues between oh. now and November. And, and then, you know, it can be brought up. if the neighbor, neighbors do have issues with it, that's an issue for the, this, this license authority to address. Historically, the only thing they have anything on that porch is if they have a golf tournament or sometimes they don't have any party up there. But mostly it's golf tournaments. So this is actually expanded into an everyday affair, which they didn't. Mm -hmm. I, can, I know that for sure it's on the ground up there. It's, it's not an everyday affair that people are up there at dinner time sitting on that porch. So this is actually expanding out a lot further. As I said, I think it's probably a good trial. And if they abuse it, then when it comes to wasting the time, so be it. All right. So I have a motion by Rick and a second by Jim. Any other discussion? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the motion, could uh, be stated that the hundred dollars fee will be waived, or is that understood now? It's already we've done it. Done it. Yeah, we we passed it on Monday that they gave it. But no, it was a good thought. Thank you, Joe. Uh, anything else? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? That is unanimous. Um, we do have a few minutes. Um, is there anything I threw on the agenda, just a reopening update in case there was anything that we needed to try to support of? I do know that um, I did a question just before coming in here this evening about the park. So I know that John and Jim, you are going to be working on that. Do we have an estimated date of when we think that there will be some guidance? So the uh, time is fair. It's not on email today. The individuals will be working together on this. So who is the, who's the leader taking on the leadership of that group? Could you put that together? That's I it's an ad hoc group, working group that consists of Member Duval, Vice Chairman Bush, Don Season, Robert Tober, and to a lesser extent, uh, Jerry and Mark, just to have professional services there. There's no appointed uh, member. I would recommend one or both of you do that. And staff is there to support you with okay. 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 I just wanted to give you a little bit of framework and I'm going to thought pool you know, all people because all Robert has. Um, the focus on the facility with DPW. Donna already threw out some really good ideas for signage uh, for it. She, she built most of our facilities, so she knows the facility. And Mark and Jerry interchangeably you know, are there to guide you in terms of the sanitation aspect. And I sent you uh, all the guidelines that I could find for the DOE today. So you have them. So can we have a um, call in Zoom meeting with the employees? Because they want to work here. Uh, most, all of those folks are here full time. Oh, they are full time. Uh, all Robert is here all the time. Don is here. Jerry Mark is here all the time. Okay, so we'll, we'll give her something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. 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 Ye
right, then right. you don't need me for that field. You know, if I'm killing you, you as a I'm happy to be here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Then we can. Five minutes. Yeah, we can have a five-minute recess. Right. <laughs> um, and we'll come back. Chief. And our first interview will be at 5:30. Chief Boyne is here, by the way. He's sitting in the hobby. Okay. Great. I'm run off to my car up right there. Okay. And I'm going to keep. The oh, oh. No. Hi there. The table might still be a little wet. I just wiped it down uh, to assure that we are sanitizing properly. Um. So welcome, Sean. Nice to meet you in person. I, I know that you had called in on Monday, uh, so you, you're familiar with some of our voices, but I'd like to go ahead and just um, have us introduce ourselves, if, if that's okay. Uh, my name is Christine Hoyt. I am the chair of the Board of Selectmen, um, and I will go this way. Hi, I'm Jim Bush, Vice Chair of Board of Selectmen. Rick Blanchard. Joe Hoyt. And John Ball. And you met Jay upon your yes. entrance. So great. So we're uh, happy that you're able to join us this evening in person. Uh, we have a, a series of questions that we're going to ask each of the candidates. Um, and we hope to get through our questions to allow some time at the end for you to ask us some questions. Um, that bottle of water is for you if you feel like you need some water. Um, so that's We'll just dive right in if that's okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, Sean, you've had a chance to review and respond to the job posting and also see the job description. Uh, can you just generally talk to us about your professional experiences and, um, and your skills and talk to us about how those will line up with the duties and responsibilities of the community for the town of Adams and what specifically makes you the right fit for our community? Um, I realize my cover letter and resume is a little long-winded, so I'm going to try not to regurgitate everything. But most relative, I think, is my past eight years of experience as a police chief for the town of New Milford. We have a population of 28,000. I feel somewhat underestimated. It's probably 30. We get to 35 in the summer. It's uh, demographically very consistent with the makeup of Adams. Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially the second part of my career, so to speak. But during that period, um, I entered into the position uh, in a very similar process to having air interviews and testing, et cetera. And I faced uh, immediate challenges of restructuring the agency. We had an uh, exodus of the command staff uh, and several senior officers uh, as a result of some uh, benefit changes that were upcoming in the uh, town uh, benefit package. Uh, I immediately looked. Uh, a SWOT assessment, uh, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats of the agency, um, and looking at the skill set of the uh, remaining command staff. It was my goal to build upon that internally, giving obviously a uh, morale boost, giving opportunity uh, for internal candidates to be essential future leaders of the agency. Um, it was uh, readily identifiable to me. Uh, one of the tenants was really highly uh, skilled, had an extraordinary background. Um, and I made some of my promotions immediately from within the restructuring command staff. I looked at issues such as diversity. Um, where are we consistent with the demographic makeup of the community? Um, and we were short on some things. So our recruitment was focused on a broader scale to meet some of the statistics related to the demographics of the community. Um, the benefits of that for me were it, it increases the connectivity with the population. Um, there's a lot of information and cultural, I'm going to say, uh, uh, concerns that go with this, and bringing candidates uh, with those cultural backgrounds into the police department educates everybody, raises awareness, and also provides us better service. So, those were some of the things. Um, that was some of the reasons that I saw some connection with that. Also, moving forward, um, we we're facing a lot of infrastructure issues. Um, some of the challenges were a complete failure of the communication system. Um, complete, I'm going to say, um, breakdown or the complete was dilapidated. It wasn't even, it was a makeup of mismatch different vehicles. We had 
looking at it, the officer were at significant risk because these weren't OSHA approved for certain vehicles and the like. So I brought some of that to the table uh, through some innovative financing uh, initiatives. We were able to revamp the fleet, uh, bring it consistent. Uh, but, you know, officer wellness and safety was a key component in some of the uh, things we looked at. Moving forward into that, uh, we had, I think on my third weekend, the radio communication console caught fire. Um, there was the communications. Um, Looking at the radio system, it was something that I had experienced equipment-wise back in the late 80s when I was with the state police. So we looked at some immediate homeland security uh, and uh, grant funding. We received a grant right off the bat, almost $200,000. We got the ball rolling, completely redesigned and structured a communication system working with our communications. And that was an exposure to see how, you know, constellation studies, site development, Tower locations, acquisition of properties by the municipality and private property, working with the community, and we're able to put together a $4.3 million communication system, state of the art, uh, multi uh, tower locations, lives of exactly uh, multicast, a uh, simulcast with a uh, microwave transmission. And the, it was state of the art, obviously, and, and it increased the safety of the, every officer. We incorporated the fire department, the ambulance, and public works into the communication system. So we had a united uh, and a, a cooperative and collective communication system. Um, state of the art, again, we didn't forecast the use of it for 10 years. We looked at a 30 year uh, service uh, availability of it, and that was uh, completed 16 months as scheduled and uh, $158,000 for the budget. Um, some of the other achievements was. Uh, our community interaction initiatives, uh, I believe in officers on foot, I believe in bike patrols, I believe in regular contact with the community, uh, residents, uh, by doing so, um, some of our um, say staff limitations didn't afford us the opportunity to have a constant foot beat officer, but also knowing that in a square, in a, in a uh, community with 64 and a half square miles, the guy walking foot is not going to get to cross the bench. So we did some initiatives for a combination of both officers required to their vehicle, have community interaction, um, record and document, uh, community contact forms, things like that. Um, and the bike patrol is certainly a huge uh, I say connection with the town. We uh, got the church groups. I focused on the community active, uh, community activists. Uh, some of our you know, the, the community groups, uh, Rotary, uh, Knights of Columbus, uh, the, um, Lions Club, uh, we're going to be meeting with them, and they were voices of the community. We could hear some of the needs, some of the desires, some of what's going on with the police department. We exercise a lot of our connectivity with the community through Facebook, social media. Um, and those were some of the things that weren't in place at the time when I got there, and it's something we developed into. And part of all that, certainly we learned and really started to capitalize on public trust. We built that, we focused on that. It was all about service, all about community interaction, and all about building trust and confidence in the police department. I wanted it to be really a sense of some of the results that were later revealed in the uh, 21st Century Policing Report. That the public had trust in us to do what we were doing, that what we were doing was legitimate. So, those are some of the important things that I feel that were um, that have uh, given me to be kind of in a position to feel confident to succeed in this position. Also, as we're, uh, you know, I negotiated uh, um, uh, three collective bargaining agreements with the uh, patrol officers, three collective bargaining agreements with our communications dispatchers, um, of which we had to address some significant financial uh, issues in town uh, to look at some of the benefit packages, not just have the standard insurance availability, we had to prepare and, and introduce uh, some hybrid. Uh, uh, benefit packages. Um, recruitment and retention was drastically affected by the pay scale. Um, it was extremely low. Mm -hmm. So, working with the um, information available to me through the Connecticut Council of Municipalities, uh, I did a wage comparison study and I was able to, working with the uh, Town Council and the Board of Finance, look at some financial initiatives to make it more interesting to be, be an employee in the town of New York. So instead of spending $100,000 per officer through the academy, we'll get some wage initiatives 
and that we heard we paid them, so we were using young officers to bear the name departments. Uh, we looked at the structure and the schedule. The, the, the work schedule was a 5 2. These officers were working 25 years with Tuesday, Wednesday off. Not the best for family life, and certainly we had an unusual uh, high rate of absenteeism by introducing that flex schedule of 5 3, five days on, three days off. They incorporated weekends and time off, our uh, sick leave of abuse, and um, other uh, leave packs. The costs over time, et cetera, decreased enormously. So, looking at that, those were again some things to make employment better. Uh, other things were school safety initiatives, uh, they were not available. So, we reduced some active aggressive shooting uh, response training quite a bit, actually. It wasn't just a conventional police are here, this is what we're going to do. I felt it important to utilize the skill set of the faculty and staff because they know the complete layout of the school. They know every nook, every cranny. All our training incorporated uh, not only the ambulance uh, uh, service or the fire service, but also incorporated the faculty and staff. They played a major role in between the evacuation, sheltering in place, um, and not just solely evacuating schools to a singular uh, off-site secure location. We established multiple so in case of threat continued outside. And also, from my experience, uh, reunification was huge. And all, everybody else you know, plans to exit the school, no one plans to get back in, no one ever plans to reunite the families when the parents show up, and I call it the minivan for baby, because the text goes out, the minivans come in. So that was some important initiatives. Um, additionally, uh, we, uh, we focused again on the uh, development of uh, personnel through training opportunities and training is, as we all know, a major cost in, in police department operations. And the remote area, I'm going to say the distant location of Milford for the training academy, I was spending two to three, sometimes four hours of overtime, just travel time for the officers. So working regionally with some of the various police departments in, in the immediate area, being the chiefs, we selected individuals for specific training opportunities. We trained the trainer, and we were holding our training locally, and that immediately cut back huge costs of overtime, of overtime related to training. Mm -hmm. and at that point in time, now we could expand training opportunities to a broader part of the department. Um, additionally, emergency response, uh, tactical teams, dive teams, accident reconstruction teams, we worked uh, regionally uh, using uh, other police department resources and focusing again collectively on our own, but again, cost saving initiatives. So, as chief, uh, I presented uh, eight five million dollar plus budgets. I never once had to uh, request supplementary appropriation for funding. Uh, we often were able to return uh, significant funds back to the community um, unexpended. Uh, my capital expenditures were kept at a minimum, they were a need. Uh, list, not a want list, um, and yet we were able to bring in equipment such as uh, 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 motor vehicle or, or uh, recorders and the uh, you know, video recording equipment into the cruisers um, for officer safety issues, evidence uh, uh, value collection, and the like. So, those are some of the important things. Uh, we worked very uh, aggressively with state asset forfeiture unit and working with narcotics investigation, seizure of monies and properties. Um, and we were in turn received over the years hundreds of thousands of dollars of state asset forfeiture monies. That's solely based on my previous experience with the state police working in the narcotics task force and working exclusively with the asset forfeiture unit the state's attorney's office. So I kind of had a good experience in the inner workings of that. Um, that process is very similar nationally because it's controlled by the federal government. So to bring that skill set to Adams would be an easy thing. Um, additionally, uh, we looked at uh, restructuring some um, operational issues in the agency. Uh, that being uh, the sectors of patrol were not efficiently laid out. We restructured those. We restructured some of our response uh, protocols. So it just wasn't a free cruiser responding to the call with the closest call principle. That was all available through the electronic mapping of the GPS system. Uh, beyond that, again, um, I think what prepared me for all this was uh, my 24 years with the state police. Um, it was a, a great opportunity.
opportunity to, um, to work in throughout the state. Um, I had experience pretty much all 169 pounds. Um, I investigated everything from uh, male mailbox uh, damage to homicide. Um, I had great exposure, great training opportunity. Uh, I started off as a patrol trooper in the northwest corner. The majority of my uh, law enforcement experience has been in rural community policing. Um, I did a, a five-year tour out in, uh, in Hartford where I served as a resident trooper. And that essentially the chief of police for a small department and a nine-man crew, seven-man, two part-time. Um, I was responsible for overall supervision, uh, the, uh, the, the operations of the department, uh, purchasing vehicles, and it really was my first hands-on experience to uh, law enforcement and this administration's chief of police. I was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 1996. I was immediately assigned to the NHC Police Statewide Narcotics Task Force. And our primary responsibility was to assist municipalities in narcotics investigations from street level all the way up to uh, major international trafficking. Um, I was predominantly uh, involved in investigations regarding uh, uh, involving uh, wiretaps, electronic oil and wire intercepts, um, working with the uh, State courts and preparing affidavits, uh, overseeing the operations, and at forfeiture, seizures of property, vehicles, monies, and again, um, seizing houses, cars, boats, and property internationally, working with the FBI, DEA, etc. So that was a great experience. I returned back to the troop working patrol operations. I was promoted in 2004 to the rank of Master Sergeant, which I was assigned to Troop B North Canaan as the Executive Officer. Uh, my lieutenant went out on leave almost immediately, XP, and I wound up as a commanding officer acting for my two, or two years uh, as a, uh, the Canaan Barracks, again, overseeing a patrol of 54 troopers, uh, a $6 million budget, um, 70 some odd vehicles, um, and two municipal police departments and resident troopers and officers. So that was my uh, introduction into command, so to speak. I was promoted in 2006 to the rank of lieutenant. I was immediately assigned to the professional standards unit. Uh, uh, and right away we started and dove into the internal affairs investigations regarding misconduct of officers, uh, of troopers in the agency. Um, it was kind of amazing. I didn't really think how crazy things could be, people could actually do, but it is. Um, most of my investigations were centered around misconduct related to domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, department policy violations. Um, I had a lot of exposure to the uh, legal affairs division of the agency, as well as the state labor department, pursuant to, obviously, testing disciplines and things like that, and testifying, preparing briefs for our uh, presentation. Um, that was a great opportunity. It really gave me a lot of background in employee discipline and, and, and oversight and policy. Um, in 2007, I returned to the troop as commanding officer Troop L. Mm -hmm. uh, we had 130 officers under my command, 94 troopers, and 57 uh, municipal uh, officers or resident troopers. Um, um, that was an extraordinary responsibility. I also worked as essentially effective officer for the district commander of the major. So. We oversaw the major crime unit, so we called out all homicide, verificated subjects, body discoveries, high profile investigations in the municipality for the life. And like I said, that was a great opportunity to prepare me for chief. Um, my law enforcement career started in the League where I grew up. Uh, my father was chief. Um, so you see firsthand what chiefs do um, growing up through it. Uh, I was able to, right after college, be hired. Um, and I thought that was an extraordinary opportunity. Um, and then I had the opportunity for the Connecticut State Police, so I wound up reaching there. Um, I just get in local schools in Lake. I mean, a lot of football up here. <laughs> um, I don't want that field up there. I'm, saying, I'm oh, sure you don't. Kind of hard. <laughs> got a few bumps and bruises up there. Um, it was always a great opportunity to play a lot of hockey up the road. Um, again, graduated from Lake High School and attended West Virginia College, where I achieved a bachelor's degree. And um, uh, sociology, concentration, study criminal justice. My training includes the Massachusetts Police Academy, the Connecticut State Police Academy, 
a graduate of the 241st session of the FBI National Academy. Um, one tenth of one percent of law enforcement in the world are accepted. That was a great opportunity the state police gave me. Um, it gave me an international network of uh, other professionals to at least constantly communicate, exchange mails of certain and current issues in the country and the world. It's just, it's just a great resource to have. Um, John, I'm going to stop you there because yep. we're going to have some specific questions. I'm sorry. Probably to draw in a little bit more of what you've been talking about. Um, but I appreciate that overview. And we're going to go, we're going to start with Joe. But before um, we go into the questions, I did fail to mention that the this is still a public meeting. I know I told you that over the phone. Um, it is being recorded. And I do have a couple of people who are on the call. So I'll just let you know that Deb Dunlap, who is our admin assistant, um, Ed St. John, who is our legal counsel, and we have a member of the public, Dan Anderson. If anybody else should enter into the room, I will let you know, as I let I like to let everybody else here know. If I'm looking at my screen, it's not because I'm being rude, but I'm just trying to manage um, those who are coming in to the room. And if I look at my phone, it might be because there's a sound issue. So um, I just wanted to make sure I was very clear on the logistics that's happening over here. Not how it would like to be an interview, but <laughs> these are the times that we're in. Okay, so if you would like to ask your first question. Okay, um, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, thinking about the town of Adams, considering it for uh, becoming our interim police chief. And uh, I want to welcome you here, and once again, thank you for uh, putting your name into the hat. And I have to say, your resume is quite impressive. Um, my question to you is, and I'm going to read it twice so that you will be able to digest it uh, and give yourself a little time for thought. In light of the ongoing protest taking place throughout our nation and abroad regarding the death of George Floyd by overzealous law enforcement personnel, do you see policing tactics and racial stereotyping continuing? Will the powers that be lent or will the same situation rise again? I ask this because there have been other racially charged and egregious actions undertaken by police resulting in the unwarranted deaths of black Americans. Still nothing has transpired to curb these happenings. Please expound on your views and discuss how racial profiling can finally be put to rest. I strongly believe that all lives matter regardless of the color of one's skin, or any other attributes which one possesses. The world is big enough to accommodate everyone if the binders are allowed to be removed, the blinders are allowed to be removed. So um, I'm going to read it this time very quickly. In light of the ongoing protests taking place throughout our nation and abroad regarding the death of George Floyd by overzealous law enforcement personnel, do you see policing tactics and racial stereotyping continuing? Will the powers that, that be relent or will the same situation arise again? I ask this because there have been other racially charged and egregious actions undertaken by police officers, officers resulting in the unwarranted death of black Americans. Still nothing has transpired to curb these happenings. Please expound on your views and discuss how racial profiling can finally be put to rest. I strongly believe that all lives matter, regardless of the color of one's skin or any other attributes which one possesses. The world is big enough to accommodate everyone if the blinders are allowed to be removed. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, have to say, I have to say one thing. Uh, I often, I have, as a professional, reserved to make comment on such events. But this event is in a whole different world of its own. We witnessed a murder in a YouTube. That, that was a murder in progress that we all had to watch. Um, so I feel very comfortable speaking what my experience has been. Working in the United States Police Internal Affairs Division, um, overseeing internal affairs operations of the Milford Police Department, I am one for accountability. Um, now, there are several important factors to understand, and uh, I think considering this is uh, real policy, I should say we have policy, have policy that's real, usable, and offer guidance. 
and I took the opportunity to read the Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy. If you look at the actions that resulted in Mr. Floyd's death by the officer, it is com it's completely in disregard for, I would say, a, a very thorough use of force policy. Um, how do we, as law enforcement, control someone's, I'm going to say, uh, recognition and conduct consistently value the policy? Uh, well, we have to go through it many ways. Real sanction for violating policy. Uh, real consequences for violating policy. Now, what's going to happen, and, what hap and that is a multiple level of policy violation, and what's more upsetting to me is I look at that and I'm heartbroken because I see Mr. Floyd. I see what's happening to him. I've investigated a lot of murder. I've never witnessed one. Other than some archive murders, uh, I, I being John Kennedy and, and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and the Vietnamese soldier, uh, the Vietnamese prisoner. But I never witnessed one that was in my lifetime. So in my 56 years of seeing that, it was a complete setback. And living and experiencing the challenges and dynamics of law enforcement, it, it's, it, I just still haven't been able to get grasp of that. So I study it and I think about it and, and wonder, well, realities are there's absolutely no regard for that man's dignity. There's no regard for that man's life. This narcissistic attitude and this demonstration of behavior kneeling on that man's neck and looking around the crowd. What's he looking for? Approval? That's absolutely, it's, it's, it's nauseating. And I've had long and involved meetings with the Country Chiefs Association on what's next. It is time for change. There has to be change. And it's sad that it's take, it's, 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 it's very sad that we're at the point that it takes something like this to do it. Now, this has been growing in the country. I realize it's starting with Rodney King. There's been investigations in the city of Bridgeport um, that I've conducted and been involved in. There's been investigations in the city of Meriden with the abuse of uh, prisoners or uh, racial profiling concerns. But the state of Connecticut, in my experience, has taken some great uh, strides in trying to address it. Um, in New Milford, we had uh, to log all interactions with persons on an official basis. Um, sex, age, race, reason, um, when the motor vehicle stopped, was the vehicle searched, not searched, um, occupants in the vehicle, and we would collectively analyze those statistics to see that we were essentially meeting our policies concerning bias-based policing. Um, we had to log in reports what efforts were made to make procedural justice. Is everybody being treated fairly? Is this a fair and equitable transparent interaction? Uh, what options and offers? What level of communication did you introduce? So those were steps I took, and I think those were remarkable steps that have been mirrored by many of the departments, and now it's becoming some official processes, just to keep the transparency and the fair and equitable treatment of both or available. But again, the demonstrations, the message is clear. It's time to change. How do we go about change? Well, most recently we have the eight can't wait. And if we're not familiar with it, it really is a fine-tuning of the use of force policy. And it really turns into something like the complete documentation of the use of force, which is done by statute. Um, uh, warning before shooting, exhausting all alternatives before reaching your least uh, deadly force level, uh, no strangleholds, chokeholds, um, uh, if you could escape me right now. But all these are addressing various aspects of use of force policy throughout the state um, and throughout the country. And a lot of policy today is completely under the, I'm going to say, the model policies prepared by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, CLIA. And that's the national accreditation standard for across the state. Now, the state of Massachusetts has its level of accreditation, Connecticut and other New England states. So it's imperative that these standards are prepared in policy and met through training. Um, we can't we can't structure train. We have to structure training to meet policy. We can't not train the policy. We can't we can't miss that. We're responsible. We have to make sure people are trained to meet policy. Yes, Sean. Um, 
We have a lot of other questions. No, I'm that's sorry. quite yeah. okay. Yeah. I've got the gist, and I know that you know we've got a number of questions, right. and uh, I don't want to short. Yeah, I don't want to short you for uh, answering because we have another candidate coming in. So, I'm sorry. thank you. No, that's quite okay. Well, I'm going to actually. My question is going to let you expand on what you were just saying. <laughs> my question is identify and discuss your experience in creating, reviewing assessing law enforcement policy and procedure, agency directives, or general orders. Since I, in the last uh, 14, uh, 12 months, I've been uh, re-employed by the Nick State Police as a temporary worker retiree. I'm working directly for the current uh, assessing current policy, procedure, uh, making recommendations for uh, policy revision uh, because the state police of Connecticut is currently under uh, um, renewal of its uh, CLIA accreditation. So I'm assigned to the accreditation unit. Um, I'm working with a retired major, and what we do is uh, make sure facilities, uh, troops, uh, support services, and uh, policies are up to standard meet the early requirements. Uh, myself, personally, um, I drafted and uh, re re uh, revised several policies in the town of New Milford um, uh, through my uh, service there, uh, bringing us to the current standards. Uh, we uh, introduced the accreditation process. Uh, we, it's a three-tier process. Um, we finished tier one with approvals. Uh, we got Tier two completed. Uh, we didn't get our final sign off. Uh, it's in process now. Um, and that would give us state accreditation. And it, the process almost mirrors FOIA, which would just be another visit from the professional agency checked off the box for me. Um, policy is uh, extraordinarily essential. Uh, beyond that, um, policy has to be uh, incorporated guide. You just can't have the rules, do this, don't do this, do this, don't. You have to have some direction in there on how to achieve the objective of the policy. Um, often absolute policy results in absolute failure. It's a guide. Uh, Bible, it's a guide, has to be understood as that. But additionally, training has to incorporate the various, I'm going to say, avenues that you can go down in your efforts to meet those policy goals. So training is not only specific to exactly the mission of the policy, but some of the variables that can be um, uh, developed or developed while you're uh, addressing or trying to comply with policy. Law enforcement is very fluid. It changes every minute, every second, every time. And we have to train our officers to adapt, improvise, and be available for change immediately. So my experience is both professionally uh, during my active career and most recently, exclusively related to policy development, policy implementation, and giving officers real and, I would say, valuable guidance within the length of those policies. Uh, Joe, a quick follow up to that. Yes. Um, in our community, with the town of Adams, the select board has responsibility for policy. I'm not sure how what the process was in New Milford, but how do you feel about working with the board of selectmen on? Review of the current policy of the police department and providing updates to the board. Well, I think that's absolutely necessary. I never heard people complain there's too much communication. And this this uh, this board has a thumb on the pulse of this community. We can draft policy that's consistent language from my experiences that may not be as effective with the language meeting the same objective that can be provided through experiences of this collective board. So I think regular meetings are necessary, regular discussion, regular action, regular planned action, and a huge part of the overall strategic planning of how the department's going to be today and where it's going to be tomorrow. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I can just insert, just as a follow-up on the same point, Chief, uh, your experience is in Connecticut, so just on the policy aspect, if you were selected, can you just tell the board how do you go about familiarizing yourself with Massachusetts? Uh, relevant law, code of mass rec, and any of the Massachusetts body that regulates police service? Uh, I've kind of already started a little bit. Um, I've got a huge network of um, municipal chiefs. Um, I've been lifelong friends with Steve O'Brien and Lennox, um, lifelong friends with uh, Gerald Finley and Stockbridge. I've been you know, associated with Bill 
Brother Walsh and Rick Harrington, uh, I don't like. Uh, so those are meeting. Um, the Massachusetts Association has an extraordinary, extraordinary information base, uh, extraordinary legal base and, and uh, available to, um, and they really offer new chiefs a lot um, coming on board and some specific, I'm going to say, direction created in just that. How much experience have you had working with collective bargaining units, and what do you consider the essential elements of effective labor management relations? I've had um, my initial, it's both my a member of the collective bargaining unit for my, my career, except for the last eight, obviously. Um, I have to say, um, formally it started in 1991 when I was on the state police uh, collective bargaining committee for a contract. Um, Kind of the guy sitting in the corner catching on what's going on, kind of learning for. Uh, participated in that um, process for about two years. Uh, since then, um, being a sergeant and then a troop commander and in charge, um, a lot of concerns that did some of the uh, managerial decisions were brought to my attention. Uh, in one troop, I had 11 different collective bargaining units uh, between janitorial, clerical, dispatch. Um, civilian employees, records, it, it was very involved. Um, I frequently met with the uh, collective bargaining representatives. Uh, their input was very important. Um, sharing information about how the department was handling business, how I was handling business, uh, really it was a, a cooperative and, and uh, I'm going to say, uh, productive working relationship. Um, since I arrived in New Milford, like I said, I uh, negotiated Three collective bargaining agreements with the control division, three collective bargaining, uh, 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 collective bargaining agreements with the uh, uh, dispatch, mm -hmm. uh, two separate unions, uh, same attorney, but two separate unions. But it was uh, it was a rewarding experience. Um, it was I had to make sure the employees got the best they could get, but I had to protect the interests of the town. You couldn't bankrupt the town, and I presented myself like that. Realistic wages, real, realistic uh, raise increases, things like that. Realistic demands. We weren't going to increase vacation to five weeks when you come in the door. We weren't going to give you a four and a half. We knew at some point in time the standard and the operational averages, uh, the accepted averages of the collective bargaining throughout the state was somewhere between two and two and a quarter. So if we could get them somewhere realistic and have a final cost projection at the end of the execution or the ratification of the contract that was acceptable to the town. The town was pretty free with me on how to get there. But I really had to cut off at a number. Um, I always came in below that number. And we always seemed to, hey, qualify um, some codified practices, some MOUs, um, some past practices that just seemed to keep floating through the contract, and clarify and qualify all those, all those into the secure template of the contract. So there were no arguments <coughs> or, I would say, disagreements with language, but it took several years to work through that. Um, there was often, we had a, I mean, there was there were grievances that were addressed uh, most of the time just through the formal mediation. Um, the union had its good and bad, I'm going to say, executive board, um, and I'm not saying good and bad for anything, but some were very limited on what you're doing this way. That's it. We had to look at options. The town is not able to afford that. So, working with that, I understand there's a lot of personalities, there's a lot of passion um, because it affects their livelihood, every decision, every word in that contract. So, uh, yeah, that's my experience. Um, drafting, all, uh, modifying, uh, working through collective bargaining, uh, several different unions, and both between state and municipalities. Um, and I got, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you talked about this in, uh, in your opening statement in regards to the diversity of your, of your department. Uh, what training and experience do you have in developing and implementing the services and programs, courses, and or learning objectives that incorporate diversity? I've attended some uh, management seminars offered by the Connecticut uh, Chiefs of Police Association. We brought in national instructors. We do a three-day uh, managerial executive training, uh, and through that, um, 
some national, uh, I would say, recruiting professionals and some of the strategies and the valuable results of the uh, recruiting uh, and introducing the diversity into the ranks. Um, specialized training, um, again, uh, working with our human resources officer and personnel. Um, who was a little bit more involved in the recruitment and training based on his previous state service with the Department of Corrections. Um, we capitalized on some, I would say, what we thought to be important. Um, we interacted with the state uh, town, um, town, or, excuse me, town council to see what they thought were important qualities. And we reached out to, I, well, I reached out to uh, some of uh, the uh, church groups and some of the community activists to see what they thought would be important. And what do you want to see in our municipal police department? What do you want to see in, in, the, in the police department? And how do you want to see us do it? Well, we'd like to see this. We'd like to see, you know, we'd like to see, uh, the, again, the diversity that matches the demographics of the community. And part of it, too, was uh, introducing the officers or the potential candidates to some of the community uh, representatives. I thought that was very important. So they could get their, I would say, put their thumbprint on who they're potentially looking at. Thank you. Did you have anything to read for follow-up? No. Oh, okay. Sorry, Joe. Um, so I have a, a budgeting question for you. Just, um, Jay, I'm going to ask you to fill in some numbers for me. So you can the budget is oh, $1.8 million. $1.8 million. Personal operating, and that doesn't include any capital expenditures. Of the total $16 million. $16 million of the town's budget. That in mind. I want to say that police and DPW are awfully close, but police is probably the most well funded department. I had it at 1.7, so I was, Why not? It was a little bit, I was close. Um, so, if you could just identify and discuss your budgeting experience, knowledge, and skill set. Uh, my budget experience started as a resident trooper in Hartford, budgeting salary, recurring and reoccurring expenses, uh, capital plan, both. One, two, uh, one, five, and ten year. Mm -hmm. um, was, uh, funding to support the facility um, and other, I would say, officer benefits such as EAT and the like. Um, but again, it was modest, it was very small. And that was a complete oversight of the first appointment. Uh, as I, uh, with the state police, I was involved in high level command meetings where we discussed some of the long range, multi million dollar you know, line items, anything relative, relative to. Uh, specialized enforcement, uh, you know, uh, contract, everything. Um, but you weren't hands on as a sole, I would say, author of that financial plan. Mm -hmm. But it gave me a good background. When I got to New Milford, um, I was presented with uh, <coughs> being able to research previous budgets, um, looking at salary, looking at we, looking at uh, projected costs, uh, some of the programs that uh, we wanted to introduce, some of the equipment we needed to support those programs, budget their financial forecast. Um, and then at that point in time, met with department heads and the agency, administrative services, the detective division, patrol services, what do you need to operate how you want to do it? And they would bring in some, I would say, wishes. At that point in time, it was time to get responsible and what do we need and what can we want and what's reality. So I would examine the for payroll, for example, uh, personnel costs. I knew how many people were at a certain, uh, um, I'm going to say, uh, uh, stage of the contract, the wage, uh, and what that cost would be. I knew there was 35 officers at step two. I knew there was 27 officers at step three. Nine officers at step five. So I knew those costs and project those into an accurate uh, pay scale and have those personnel costs almost to the dime. What was fluid, obviously, was uh, overtime cost, the sick leave, all the overtime cost, the, the, the major storm event or something. So those were almost fluid, but working through, I can say, past experience and past history, we were able to bring those pretty close. At that point, Tom looked at opportunities to supplement funding to grants, supplement different uh, programs, such as equipment and, and potential services like additional craft enforcement. To a forecast of available grants. You kind of look at the grant set schedule and see what you've applied for in the past and what you got, usually got again next year. So that was kind of a very valuable tool. Um, I had a wonderful finance director. Um, I incorporated the mayor in some of my strategic planning and financial planning. 
uh, again, with a very valuable resource was the financial director, especially early on. Uh, as you do this, so you can do that. Um, and that led to uh, uh, looking at potential for additional personnel, looking at retirement, where we might be, and then you have to capitalize on academy training costs. You have to look at reoccurring uh, mandated uh, state annual training costs. So all those were calculated and presented in the budget. With that, um, capital expenditures for everything from, uh, you know, furniture, furniture replacement. Um, we did set up early on centralizing information technology. So I didn't have a police lieutenant programming and fixing and straightening out computers. Mm -hmm. We had a computer profession to it. Um, I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, sworn law enforcement transporting uh, mail to the town hall. So we took a lot of those, and those were different line items we had to add for additional personnel, but we kept sworn personnel when we sworn the police business. So with that, um, not only was it drafting the budget, but it was making it more efficient. So my experience was uh, preparing a budget draft, uh, meeting with uh, the finance board, um, purchasing committees, going over capital expenditure, interest, going over occurring and recurring expenses in the budget process and plan budget. And then at that point in time, presenting my budget publicly mm -hmm. in a hearing, um, I did that through Windows and PowerPoint. And it was, and looking at the Adams budget, I wish I could present it like that. We had a line item for one pence, but it was crazy, but it was very involved. <laughs> so it was uh, um, involved. Um, my budget was met with little or no uh, concern. Um, often uh, complimented as being open, often commented as being thorough mm -hmm. and informative uh, on the presentation. Um, and they were approved with uh, pretty much minimal cuts, if any, that weren't affecting, that would not affect our operations. So, um, my budget experience. Thank you. And I will say, we might not have a line item for a pencil, but you will be questioned on every line item by the Board of Selectmen and our finance committee. So I can assure you that it is a, a tough process. I found the reason the question was just a full justification and it was satisfying most the interest. I just wanted to clarify. So, okay, second um, As a lifelong resident of Adams, I have witnessed the evolution of our police department. I vividly remember as a young man the officers walking the streets and addressing you as you pass by. The nightly rounds to stores to check their, for their security, the writing of tickets for expired parking meters. In short, the Adams police had a visible presence and you knew who they were. Times have changed, they always do. No longer do the town's police officers walk the beat. They drive their cruisers to accomplish their tasks. No longer do they check stores after closing. Instead, they shine a spotlight on the business facade and move on. No longer do they write parking tickets for meter violations. We get to add a town position to make this transaction. I must admit that I cannot put a name to a face of all of our police officers. What is your take on policing, which I term resident friendly? That's the way I grew up. You know, who was walking on the street and knew me by name, yeah? My father has an effect on that. <laughs> um, I try to get that back in the middle. Um, simple as wave to people if you drive down the street, say hello. Um, it was remarkable how many officers responded to this. You know, Do you know this guy? Well, I, I met him, yes. Oh, he said he's very hot. I thought was pretty good. Um, yeah, uh, I would, as a chief, maybe it's micromanagement, I try to stay away from that. But I would ensure that my supervisors would make regular checks on midnight shift of the back stores and get every check. And not just tire tracks around the building. I want to see footprints on the door. I want people to grab doors. I thought it was very important. Our industrial base was huge, but we had enough people to minimally accommodate a portion or, or a large portion of that on uh, minimum one night, one, one day a week, two days a week. Um, in Adams, um, I, I see the culture, I see the demographics, I see the structure and the, of this community very similar to what I grew up in. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask officers uh, to make a physical check. I think the business owners deserve it. I think it's necessary to have an officer on the street. I think it's necessary to see the officers. I think it's necessary for the town board of selectmen and uh, the 
government to know who's their workers working for. Um, this driving around with the windows up and your sunglasses on your forehead and, and just getting to and from where you got to go has to expand it. Regular interaction, conversation with residents. Stop, talk to the kids, go to the playground, go to the ball game. Um, when I started my career in, in New Milford, I was appalled that I didn't see a cop grabbing a coffee. I'm like, why don't you grab a coffee? Say, I had a store on it. Oh, we got enough. Well, I want you in the store. I want you to have coffee. I want you to have communication. You'll learn so much. You'll learn who people are. And there might be just a store owner. It's going to be the guy getting coffee. It's going to say, Hi, I'm Joe Smith. I'm Tim Brown. Whatever. Um, that's all part of community policing. That's why community policing, 21st century policing, is it's what cops used to do. We don't do that anymore. We've got to get back to it. We're not trained to do it. The trainers that are training young officers don't have experience in that. So, you know, it, it takes an old guy like me to say, look, this is the right way to do it. And then what you're doing is not wrong, you can just do it better. So I'm an advocate to have officers on the street. And walking down the street, seeing an expired meter, you can write a citation, you can write a warning. But raise the awareness that there's a violation. And you're getting paid anyway. So I'm an advocate to be, be involved, be active, be engaged, grab doors, talk to people, say hello, and just be around. It's not, you don't have to get, I don't know, it, it, it's, 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 it's concerning. I don't have an excellent answer, but I do have an answer that takes supervisory oversight and a change in culture. And it's something that might be a little resistant at first, but once they find out the reward, and I used to tell my guys, my women, the agency, when you interact with somebody, make sure you're done. And when you finish, is there anything else I can do for you? That one statement was miles with the community. There's a lot of feedback. Yeah, so thank you. Okay, the Adams Police Department works closely with the Adams Fire Department, Adams Forest Force, EMS, Regional Emergency Management, and State Police as well as community-based organizations. What has made you an effective collaborator in your current or past jobs? Uh, working in one of the most remote areas of the state of Connecticut, um, some of my control areas, your closest help was one of the firemen driving by. So I always had a great rapport with the fire department. I had great appreciation for it. My grandfather, my uncles, were long-time volunteers for the fire department. Um, there's one the siren going off and the pickup trucks heading out the yard. We all live in the same neighborhood. So I understand the commitment of both the volunteer uh, fire departments and the professionals, but there's an awful lot to say in, you know, respect, respectful for the commitment. So I have always had the fondest respect for those that volunteer to serve and those that serve and put themselves at risk. But that being said, it's a very productive relationship because it's a huge component of the tax base. It's a huge voting uh, influence. And if we can support the fire department as best we can, we'll get their support. It's simple things like a motor vehicle accident. You might have the road shut down. You don't have the officer available to stand there and direct traffic for two, three hours for, for whatever reason. But the volunteer and the commitment of the fire department will often jump in and handle and help out with traffic control. So I've always had a, a, a lot of exposure to the area fire departments. Um, I work closely, closely with multi-community uh, emergency management directors, county management directors. Um, I exercise a lot of, uh, um, of the resources with the state police when I was with the Milford. I knew what they had, I knew some of the things, and those are huge cost offsets. When the town being committed to these, I'm gonna say high risk, low frequency, uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, use of resources that normally the state police would have to have. So it's important to have a positive and productive relationship with the state police. Um, Barracks right up the street. I could have no reservation meeting regularly with the troop commander. Um, I'm not sure who's up there now, but I know some of the troopers that do work in the area. Um, they, I talked to a few of them. They said they got a great report with the guys for the PD, women at the PD. So yes, it's very important we have uh, a very effective and there should be regular communication on what their needs might be from the police department. Certainly I would express what my needs are for you know assist the police department. 
So I always have regular meetings with the fire departments in, in Milford. Um, they were volunteers for the city of uh, town that size. But a great group of guys. I uh, always invited to their, they got the best state dinner, I'll tell you that. But um, I always got invited to their dinners or meetings, uh, wherever we go. We share training opportunities. We incorporate the fire department, a lot of our training, and they would incorporate a lot of the police. So, very effective to have a positive and supportive relationship between the two. And the other, you know, professionals as well. Thank you. Everything. Thank you, Bob. The reason I'm glad to mention the police chief question. What is your experience working with the district attorney's office? Uh, Pittsfield, uh, I'm familiar with the recent uh, assignment of uh, District Attorney Harrington. I know uh, some of the investigators assigned her office, uh, Mass State Police, working with them in the northwest corner of Connecticut. Um, I have to say, in Connecticut, I have been highly involved with the state's attorney's office. Uh, most recently, uh, I've worked with, uh, obviously, the chief in the Milford, but I've done some high-profile investigations under the direction of the state's attorney's office, specifically with Wood County, Dave Sheepak, uh, Don Gallo, uh, Dave Shannon, in fact, from my phone. Uh, beyond that, um, I mean, I was, I used to, we, in, in the state of Connecticut, um, in order to, Execute a search warrant requires a uh, review of a state's attorney and signature of a neutral court magistrate. And some of the actions and, and, and investigations we're conducting would require a spontaneous execution of search warrant. So, more than once, I've been to uh, the state's attorney's house at 3 4 in the morning. You need to look at this day. We're going to get hit in the store later this morning, and I got Judge Bass Savage on standby. So I'd be in the kitchen, put coffee on, cooking breakfast in, in this kitchen. So I've always had a great rapport with the state's attorney, only because I had a very uh, aggressive and ethical work ethic, uh, 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 I would say, a work style. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, well, I think the conversation for a secondary round of references, he said they should be calling. But that being said, I, I understand that they have a chief law enforcement agent in the county. Um, they, we, we, we are required to cooperate with our office in every way. Um, I think regular meetings, uh, available interaction, um, to meet the request and requirements of our office are, are necessary and will be done. Thank you. John. This question involves a few different, uh, uh, about three different uh, breakdowns of questions. The position of police chief requires a high degree of accountability. What does accountability mean to you in a legal sense in regard to data and metrics in terms of relations with the community? And I just want to state with regards to data and metrics that that's something that has been lacking um, to this board for information to determine how are things going, you know, how are we doing, you know, what you know, what are the metrics of the department? It is not to use um, negatively against the department. It's just that the board needs to develop a budget or a the community with their support to pass budgets and to support our police department. So without any information coming this way, it's very difficult for us to help. Um, so that, that's one of my personal main areas is metrics and measures, things like that. I've, I've got to kind of wrap myself around it because it's, it's the one aim of who I am. But I've got to, I, I, I know where you're coming from. I, I, I know chiefs that have embattled themselves with not sharing information with the councils that oversee really what's going on. Accountability. Um, I've learned over the years that law enforcement and being higher up in law enforcement, you're into a smaller fishbowl every time you move up. And everybody knows what you're doing. Um, I'd visit a restaurant with my wife. Oh, the chief was at here last night for dinner. The mayor would call. He went to dinner last night. I'm like, well, yeah, we went to you know, Giuseppe's or whatever. And she's like, we well, didn't call me. Well, I, you know, jokingly. But so I know how attentive people are and what's going on. Now, I may not even realize who they are, and they, but they'll know who I am. So accountability is a 20, I'm going to say 25 day situation. It's going to be 25 hours a day, eight days. They're going to know who I am, what I'm doing. And they will know how I'm doing it because it might not be from their personal observations, but something within the agency is going to 
think that disclosure because they have an open and honest relationship with that individual. I have nothing to worry about. I think that's all the voice in them. I always think the Lord's watching. I always think that I'm going to do something wrong. So I always, you know, it's, it's I always say, what am I doing? What awareness will this create? Who's going to read about it tomorrow in the paper? And what's going to be said after review by someone who doesn't know the fact? So I'm always cautious for that. And I learned that more than ever. But it's necessary to develop proper report or reporting procedures. Um, I mandated a daily printout of case log uh, with the calls for service work with who they involved, what they involved, um, and I prepared that for public news groups. So even if the reporters came, they want to look at the police department's doing, there you go. Obviously, you probably would act for some the statute with medical issues, et cetera, and things like that. But the reality is, is that if I'm doing it for reporters, that surely should demonstrate that I'm doing it for the council. And I try to meet with the town council on a regular basis for the town meetings to tell them exactly what's happening to the police department. Not rumor, not innuendo, but factually, here's where we are. And I thought it necessary, especially during the height of some of the commitment of our officers into the, the theater of, of war over Iran and Iraq, that hey, I got a letter from you know, Jimmy Jones, and he says hi, and I would leave it for them. I would send emails regularly to members of the town council that, you know, this happened the other night. So I made regular notification, and I shared information openly. Again, it's public record. But it's your public, and there's no reason why. And the more you know, the less you'll have a question of what I'm doing. And if you don't like it, I'm sure I'll be right on your doorstep to say, you know, what are you doing while I'm this is happening? So it, it'll relieve you of having questions. It will relieve the, the board of wondering what's going on. And I think it'll give you uh, an accurate focus of where we're going. And you'll see some of the future requests of why that request is there. Thanks. So, Sean, we have a, a, a little bit of time, so um, I just want to, my follow-up question will be to just ask if, or my final question will be to ask if there's anything that we didn't ask that you wanted to share with us um, this evening, if you wanted to take a couple of minutes. There's something in your experience that you really think that you can bring to the table and we just didn't ask you about if you wanted to. If you allow me to come back in about 40 minutes. That's what I think about and remember I will. Um, I, I am prepared uh, to uh, move forward in this position. Um, I, like I said, I have a vast amount of experience. Um, I pretty much conducted myself uh, with the most professional and personal integrity throughout my career. I've treated everybody I've encountered with dignity and respect. I share a high level of respect and return from many of the people. Um, I run into people often that you know, I put in jail. And I know you're doing it. You know, you've got about off, you know, mm -hmm. set off a little bit. But um, I've never had, you know, the, the negative, I would say, reaction from people because I treated people with respect. And I think that's important. And I want to make sure the officers under my command do that. Again, very simple. These aren't your enemies. These are people who made mistakes. These are people who we are now not warriors against. We are now guardians of. So you move forward with, you know, we're more to a caregiver atmosphere in law enforcement than we are, a, you know, private people of rights and liberty and things like that. So training must incorporate that. It's all in the sense of training and crisis intervention training. It's all out there for us that we have to, we have to pursue. Um, essentially, my resume says it all. Um, I'm looking forward to returning to the area. I still have property to leave. Um, my wife and I are, we've talked about this at length. Um, this opportunity will certainly give our kind of working test period of being, so to speak, mm -hmm. if it avails. Um, but I'm familiar with the community. I'm familiar with the lifestyle. I, I really enjoy life, the lifestyle in this area, Berks County, et cetera. And I think the more I was away, the more I learned to really realize what, it's a very unique area. I work in all 169 towns in the state of Connecticut. I didn't see what I saw and grew up in, in this area. I just didn't see it. I didn't live it. And so I, I want to come back to it. And I want to come back to it what I like to do. So I want to just. One, one thing that we haven't touched on, I mean, uh, Prime Minister touched on the legal, but are you certified to be an officer, police officer in Masco? I presented a copy of my advisory letter from the uh, Commonwealth Massachusetts Police 
police officer. I know Mary Beth has since retired. I did call prior to that application. Um, I'm still certified as a police officer in Connecticut. It's called a uh, comparative uh, qualification. Uh, it will incorporate probably 30 to 64 hours of online uh, review and and then an application from the town manager for certification and that's it. Okay. I only ask because I don't know if you kept up on the news. One of a, uh, another community in county hired a chief. He worked for quite a while, and then they found out he wasn't qualified to work in mass as a uh, police chief, police officer, or anything. Uh, I had those investigations in Connecticut. Um, it's, it's a delicate process. Um, I'm very familiar with the certification pursuant uh, to the police officer standards and training council in Connecticut. Like I said, I did have interaction uh, with Mary Beth Donahue out of the uh, Randolph Mass um, in the follow up phone call. Prior to the submission of the application here, that's why I want to share the entire thing. But I think what's going to require is a, another just maybe current advisory. I'm going to get that answer, but it's nothing more than a request. Obviously, we're familiar with um, And again, I know it's an early start date. This was something where you were to, uh, I was given a board of the opportunity. I was in the reservations to secure all that interest prior to final commitment. And only in a position they don't want to. I think that language would probably be worked into the, the contract okay. for labor council. The so time frame to achieve certification consistent with the PTC requirements. So, Sean, do you have any questions of us? I, I know it's going to be a whirlwind process. I know you're, you're on the fast track or essentially in the left lane. <laughs> um, I like I said, I, I do plan to officially return to the area, not with these temporary arrangements I have. Um, again, being potentially yes or no in almost six months, I, I, I'm, that's just the open and forefront. I will be, um, my wife and I have already looked at some real estate opportunities. So it's in the process, but it's, we're not committed to buy a house tomorrow. Just, but again, I'm very prepared to be at home. So. Did you play in the 1979 music game for the Calgary Champions? Because you might have been a little bit young at the time. So I would leave. Yeah, not that only came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank, they, not Frank, they never done. Uh, Great Big County Sheriff. Lou Caroni. Oh, Caroni, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he changed your helmet. Wait, we're all, we're all angry about that. Yeah, that was a, that was a tough game. That was a tough game. You guys were good. So I got to be so. Were you on that team? I was on the Lucy Valley team. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were? No, kidding. There you are. Yeah, we had a, we had a <laughs> couple of running backs. Yeah, you guys. In fact, our, our quarterback, Dave Eisenberg, right? Without the other question here. We just brought down some big farm boys. Well, you're probably split wood all morning before the game. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is amazing how the whole county's changed. You know, the mills are closing. The uh, big offering to the federal community and the cultural arts. Oh, I see our visitation and stuff. So, again, great transition. Okay. Anything else? For us? Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. I, I sat on board with the Connecticut Chiefs Association, selecting chiefs. I know. Level of involvement, the stay awake night hours, thinking of what questions to ask and what right answers. And um, I've had some experience. I, I, think your, I think your questions will really um, dial in the right guy, the right candidate for you. So I think it's an extraordinary, very, I would say, uh, interesting and rewarding process. For okay. And um, as I mentioned, we are moving quickly through this process. Our uh, chief is scheduled to retire mid July. Um, he has indicated that he could make himself available after that date, if, if need be, if the process goes a little bit longer. Um, but we expect that we would be in touch with you at some point next week to let you know where we are in the process. Um, we do have three evenings of interviews, and um, which I think I told that to you on the phone. Um, but if anything should come up, I have a, another question about the process. I believe you have my contact information. You have uh, the town administrator's contact information. I, I see some of the names that popped up, and I've worked with them all except for the candidate from Indiana. So, okay. they're an old so. Yeah. Uh, great guys.
Good. And the other thing too to keep in mind, Chief, is that uh, applying for the interim position, either being awarded the position or not awarded, you're, that does not have any impact on your choice to apply for the permanent position. That will also be posted again. And we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed for a, a late summer restart on that. Um, one other thing, I know the position officer that the package. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a personal note, I'm not requiring that. I have, I can carry my benefits from my retirement, which I choose to do so because it's very, um, it's a great package. And my wife would probably say the worst. <laughs> so. Understood. <laughs> we wouldn't want that to happen. I know it's a, a savings to the town on that. But that's yeah. just uh, my personal side. Thank you. All right. Uh, before COVID, I would have been shaking your hand and, and thanking you in that way <laughs> for being here. Um, but I, I do thank you on behalf of I all mean, of us. I appreciate you getting your time. I know it's minute. And if we don't meet again, it's very nice meeting everyone. And uh, we'll see you again. Thank you. And um, if we could just take a five minute recess before the next candidate comes in, that would be fantastic. And uh, yeah. Yeah. How are you? As I mentioned, how everything's been wiped down. Okay. So it's safe. It's probably that's why it smells like Clorox in here. Um, and Jeff, I know I, when we spoke on Monday, I told you that this is a public meeting um, and that we are doing this via remote participation for the public to participate. I can let you know right now, uh, it, the meeting is being recorded. Um, and the individuals on the call right now, we have our admin assistant, Deb Dunlap, who's helping us with minutes. And we have legal counsel, Ed St. John III, who's also on the call. Um, if anybody should pop into the call, I will let you know, as I like to let everybody else in the room know. Um, I am not being rude if I look at my screen. I don't mean to be rude, um, but I'm just handling the logistics of who's in the room and what's going on with the screen. So my apologies up front. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think I've gone through all of those announcements early this time. I forgot before. So we'll go ahead. What we're going to do is we each have a couple of questions that we're going to ask. We'll kind of go around the room um, and hopefully leave some room or leave some time at the end for you to ask us some questions. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, just get started. And if you could briefly just tell us how um, your professional experiences and skills line up with the uh, duties and responsibilities for the police chief for the town of Adams and what specifically makes you the right fit for our community. Sure. So my name is Jeff Cohn. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for allowing me to be part of this interview yeah. process. Um, I am the chief of police in Dalton currently. I've been uh, I've had a 23 year career in law enforcement there, working through ranks of part time to full time sergeant, which was also civil service. Then I went through an assessment center and a local interview panel for the selection for chief. Um, and I've been chief for eight and a half years now. Uh, what would make me uh, fit here is having that experience right here in Berkshire County. Um, I also did a lot of mutual aid work back in the days with Detective Ordina, uh, a lot through the DA's uh, task force um, where I did work right here. Um, so this community has always uh, just caught my eye. When I started commuting to chief meetings with Chief Tarsa, uh, I always told him, for some reason, I, if I ever leave Dalton, Adams is the only place in the county that really caught my, it's, it's just beautiful. Um, but first of all, you have a very good uh, slice of business and commercial. That's something we're lacking in Dalton and residential. Um, but more importantly, it's the professionalism of the Officers in your police department, you have a good department that has a good name in the county um, amongst the other departments. But what stood out to me was the similar um, trust and support that your community members have for those officers, very similar to what we have in Dalton. We have tremendous community support. So uh, it, it is what caught my attention. And my experience, uh, again, here in Berkshire County, I think, would allow me, uh, and I don't know who you're interviewing, and I know there's other candidates, 
would allow maybe me uh, have a, a little bit of um, an opportunity to ground run so that my the partnerships I have with the, the sheriff's department, um, with the DA's office, I, I've been in North Berkshire Court, Central Court, and South County Courts. Um, with uh, my work with Virtual Law Enforcement Council, which is uh, an entity that all the chiefs and county meet once a month, um, we've been very active with that. So I know that I know the surrounding chiefs, uh, all along from Dalton, that we just communicate well as a county. So I think I would be able to hit the ground running as far as keeping your imprint in a seat at the table and a face that people know to the call. Um, you know, everyone has my cell phone number that are officers in the counties. We, we operate on mutual aid. Uh, is, a, is a necessity for all of our small towns. Um, so I think that would, that, that would help me. I do know some of your officers, um, you know, the, new, the newer officers I, I may have met, but I'm not very familiar. All law enforcement departments, by the way, all police departments are dealing with a very young, uh, newer uh, force. Uh, you know, the, the joke uh, I, I always had with the seniors in my town was, I don't know who the officers are anymore. But I don't know that either, you know, it's just because there, there's just a high turnaround. Uh, and state police, I don't know if you're having that problem, state police has just been, uh, well, once we get someone paid and trained, and about that four or five year mark, on, you know, so they're comfortable making decisions, the state police grab them from mm -hmm. us. So we've been having that ever, never ending cycle of filling in vacancies and spending money. Okay. It either happens or the threat happens. That them go to the <coughs> Um, one of the things I did not do is we did not do introductions, so when you do uh, ask your first question, if you'll state your name, I know we have nameplates, and if the um, traffic noise gets to be too much, it's, I guess let Jay know because he's closer to the windows, and he'll help us with the, the windows, but it's helping with a little bit of a comfortable cross breeze. So that's, that's all of my hospitable announcements. But, uh, Joe, if you'd like to ask your first question. Yes, I would. Uh, and first of all, thank you for your interest in um, becoming the interim chief of our community. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Joe Novak. Um, I'm a lifetime resident of Adams, and I'm in my third term as selectman. Um, and my question to you is, in light of the ongoing protest taking place throughout our nation and abroad regarding the death of George Floyd, by overzealous law enforcement personnel, do you see policing tactics and racial stereotyping continuing? Will the powers that be relent, or will they, or will the same situation arise again? I ask this because there have been other racially charged and egregious actions undertaken by police officers, officers, resulting in the unwarranted death of Black Americans. Still nothing has transpired to curb these happenings. Please expound on your views and discuss how racial profiling can finally be put to rest. I strongly believe that all lives matter regardless of the color of one's skin or any other attributes which one possesses. The world is big enough to accommodate everyone if the blinders are allowed to be removed. Here, here, uh, first of all. Um, and that's a, it's a very long and complicated question, and I have I have an answer. Uh, first of all, there's two things uh, that your your question addresses: is police brutality and discrimination, um, and they have to be fought separately. I don't I don't want to because some of what you're seeing is brutality, and some of what you're seeing is nationwide over a period of time. I'm not saying just with the Floyd case. I'm saying what what you're saying is leading to the national. Uh, push here, and both of those need to be addressed. Um, your police department and in Berkshire County, we do a lot to address both. Um, particularly, uh, the chiefs have met with Multicultural Bridge, uh, Gwendolyn Hampton Van Zandt. Uh, I work, I personally worked with her in our school district, uh, and it has to be countywide. And what I like about the bridge program. Uh, which is a nonprofit out of Great, uh, I think it's out of Great Barrington, um, and other districts have used it, uh, is that they take on an approach for the entire county. And to answer your question, that's how you deal with, first of all, the discrimination uh, of people of color. And to help people get educated, I think there's a fear of talking about discrimination, 
And I think at first you have to have that conversation and just what we learned at our committee is just meeting once a month and having that, the bringing the people together was a great launching point. And after about, after about three months, and the first couple of meetings there was some hurt feelings, you know, a lot of people didn't like having the uncomfortable conversation and you, they help you learn, uh, look at, get comfortable about being, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable. You gotta have these questions. We don't talk about discrimination, we're not gonna solve it. So they, they, they really do lay out the foundation of baby steps and kind of get everyone on the same page. And you start realizing when they're talking about discrimination as a white male, and I was a white male cop in the room, okay, and with educators and everyone else from the community, they're not, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily pointing the finger at you saying you. They're trying to get you to understand the idea and their feelings, and if you listen, um, you know, they have a lot to say, and a, and a lot spreads, the crosses boundaries, and it, it does you know. Um, and so we've been doing work with North Coastal Bridge in the First County for, uh, in the uh, Central Berkshire Regional School District uh, for about two years now. It is a process. It's not a quick hit and run. you got to stay with it, and you got to dedicate time to it. But um, we were really gearing up, so they did, uh, they, they introduced some curriculum for the kids, they did some training, they had great, uh, a great play uh, pipeline down in uh, Great, Great Barrington that we were all invited to watch. That really spoke to the kids, so they're, they're speaking to the kids on multiple levels, not just in the classroom, but after school activities and, and, and some philosophies, um, and in workshops, they have great workshops, even with educators, but they, that was, while they're doing one front with the students, they were doing another front with the educators and the administrators, and then, of course, they had outside groups like the police department, and we were part of that. We were just getting to the point where we were going to start having community, I was, I was on the community outreach committee, that was one of my, my uh, committees that I was assigned to, and we were just starting, uh, we're a seven-town school district, it makes it a little difficult, difficult because we are a lot of land area. So, and, and uh, the more you get into the hill towns, there's just not the resources that you have, like a, a resource center to go to. So we're, we're thinking, how do we include people? Because what you're talking about really is inclusiveness. And so we're going to have three venues, one in Dalton, one in Hinsdale, one in Beckett, where we, you know, not only announce, but we go and specifically invite people to attend, because that's, that's a big thing, too, is people who don't feel that they're part of a community or a group, they're going to show with a, a, a bulletin and a paper. You have to go and reach out. And we we're going to have uh, short sessions, uh, maybe a movie night. And we had these ideas, and then COVID hit, and you know now we're withdrawn even more. So I, I, those are some of the, the answers. It, it's very easy if you don't have enough multicultural bridge. All their work, like uh, not in our town, it's a it's a anti um, discrimination um, uh, pledge that you take. There is so much material that your town, no matter who you choose for chief, can go to and use. Um, but two things that I think is getting that type of training to your police officers, and I know your police officers here have had some of that. Over the last four years, Massachusetts has made sure that mandatory training in increments and their stability blocks over the last four years have been happening. Um, so hopefully, uh, you've been seeing that in your officers. Um, and I think your officers have as much face-to-face -face community contact as, as we do in Dalton. And really, that's that's what it is. It, you got to start just talking to people. If you sit in your cruiser and keep on going, nobody's going to know you, nobody's going to trust you. Um, and those interactions help. But there's materials that we're starting to use, like I said, and it, and it helps that it's the school administration that's leading it, because that is the big I mean, it's, it's part of, I don't know if it's the same here, it's half our budget, half every town's budget on this. So, and they have, that this is what they do, they teach, they, they set venues, um, you know, do field trips, so I'm glad they're leaving it and bringing us in. I know it's a long answer, but it was a complicated question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, hey, uh, Rick Blanchard. Uh, my question is identify and discuss your experience in creating, reviewing, assessing law enforcement policy and procedure, agency directives, or general orders. Sure. That's, uh, so I've been working on that the last two years. Um, 
there is a state agency called Massachusetts Accreditation uh, Commission, and they help uh, agencies, uh, big and small, to try and get to accreditation, which is the best standards. You may have heard of OEA, that's the national standard that we have mass accreditation. Um, they follow very uh, closely with Colia, but as you know, Massachusetts laws and Massachusetts government is very much different than everywhere else in the country. So, uh, our, you know, through Massachusetts Police and Western Massachusetts, we all kind of gravitate to our, our entities because they do take into account mass laws which separate. So, it's not that the best practice is so different, it's just you got to you got to kind of pigeonhole it for Massachusetts. And they have standards and templates. In addition, the last couple of years, and this is this is huge, the last time Mass Chiefs, which we all have these policies on, we went about the building over on School Street, had the book that was 2000, 1999, 2000, and it's just antiquated. Mass Chiefs has had their in-house counsel, so it's, a, it's an attorney, writing and updating policies that are in line with the accreditation standards. They're then sending it to, um, uh, to the accreditation agency to vet it. They're sending it to Mass Training Council, the Police Training Council or the Academy where we go to, to make sure it's in, in, in line with them. And then they're sending it to the Executive Office of Public Safety. Uh, what an ingenious idea. So then they're handing them to chiefs. They're coming out piecemeal. I mean, it's not that you can't comprehensively look at your own policies and say, okay, this is old. Um, you know, our policy is still set control. Uh, I've changed all of it, you know, as a quick search and search and find and swap with the patrol officer. Um, you know, those are just quick things, but, um, but then you have to take what they, they send out because it's, it's meant for all departments across the, uh, across the state and tailor make it to your agency. You guys have three sergeants. I have one, uh, one on second shift. I have no sergeant. I mean, um, you know, I think there's a possibility or there's been a, a, a lieutenant in the past. Like, you would want to, who's the, who's the on-call supervisor? Who's the senior supervisor? Those, the tasks still remain the same. You just assign who does uh, the line officer, the supervisor, and then uh, above for review. So there are standards out there. It's not as difficult ever, as everyone sees, uh, thinks. Um, and they set up a self-assessment, then certification, and then full accreditation so you don't have to look at the whole thing. You're kind of... I think there's, uh, it's over 50 standards. I want to say it might even be close to 70 standards. So you can do like the first 20 in your self-assessment. Once you pass that, you're working towards self-certification and, and uh, uh, I don't know, I don't believe there's any other police agency in Berkshire County other than Great Barrington that's made accreditation. Uh, most of us are in service uh, self-assessment. Um, I, I probably re revamped close to two dozen policies in the last two years, bringing in my union president from the onset, my supervisor, I only have one, but I bring in a supervisor. And if it's a specialty area, um, if it's firearms or defensive tactics, I bring in those officers and we sit down and we say, how can we best curtail this to our department? And when you do that from the onset, it's very easy to get these passed. I know you have mass coalition police, we have mass coalition. I was actually the area 12 vice president uh, for many years before I got promoted. Um, if you bring them in early and ask questions and give them prior notice and an ample opportunity to talk, most problems disappear and you can pass these policies. So it's not as difficult as people think of. One quick follow -up. I'm not sure the situation in Dalton. Here, our charter designates the board of selectmen as the policy writers for the police department. Mm -hmm. We just Got to see that maybe two months ago. Got it from Rick. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's Rick Bigelow. Cool. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we're in the process of looking at that. And we'd be looking to update. And as far as your supervisor, the hell of a guy. Yes, he is. Madam Chair, just a quick follow up. Cool. So, as Rick mentioned, the board selectmen is involved with policy, uh, writing, updating. Um, with, with, of course, the voice of the top manager and the police chief. Um, did your board selectmen have any role in the update of your policy in Dalton? So, yes and no. Uh, depending on what the policy was, there was an interest. Otherwise, if it was, because a lot of these are just 
like the domestic uh, response to domestic abuse. There's been changes in the case law since that was, you know, it's not reflected. So when you when it was changing just law, it's it's really spoofed to us. Well, this is the law now, so you just kind of you take out section A and you put in the new case law. So on those type of things, it, there really wasn't paid on a formal, and it is in mind. You know, it, it depends who you ask us. There was a there was a, I served under many boards, and there was uh, a board uh, that felt this so they they approved it, but it's it was written up in my contract and my job description that I passed all policy. So um, it's not that I'm against, and, and if it's in your charter that you pass it, it's just. More, more the way I see it is if you look at if you're going to discipline on policy or want discipline, why not bring you in so you clearly understand that policy before you uh, make decisions on policy? So I have no problem with them. Um, it, it was just convenient for me for time's sake, uh, based on how town meetings are set up and public information, that certain ones were just hey, just so you know, the change in law, this was updated, okay. Um, I our form of government is a little different. We have a town manager, so my direct boss was my town manager, so I had that day to day. Okay, go ahead. Uh, whereas the select board um, was more of the appointing and firing authority. Yeah, I'm personally, I'm, we're not looking for state law, state law. Yeah. I'm just Adam's policy, more sure. or less. You know, uh, well, I think go wear the blue uniform with the. Sure. The I, cap think, and the, I think the distinction that I when, when I spoke with there's a distinction between personnel management, personnel policy, and then there's street policy, short policy. Oh yes, yes. yes. Like the rules and regulations might be certainly. Uh, yeah, I mean the rules and regulations you would want everyone on board um, before they got approved. Again, I'm, I'm you're asking I'm a little bit different. I have a little more uh, leeway, and I could go to directly my town manager and get things done. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, yes, administratively, how things are done in the police department, my, my board would certainly want to hear about and, and weigh in on. These are two members of the Public Safety Committee of the Board of Selectmen. So they have a, a, a big interest in the policy, <laughs> for good reason. Hi, I'm Jim Bush, I'm Vice Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, how much experience have you had working with a collective bargaining unit, and what do you consider the essential elements of elective labor management relations? So my just about my entire career, I've had uh, experience. So I think in I'm trying to think what our our number is. Now this is where we joined, but uh, we we were an association when I joined. We had uh, it was. We just had meetings and we didn't have an attorney or we didn't pay dues. And we, we looked at mass coalition, this who you have, so it fits in. During that time, I served as a negotiator uh, for patrol. Then I, uh, I, I left that, or then I became the area uh, vice president and I went to Worcester last year and served on the uh, main board. Uh, and when I became sergeant, I felt as though, uh, or when I wanted to become sergeant, I felt as though I should kind of distance myself from the dark side of management versus labor. Um, and then when I became uh, on the management side, because I had come from that, I eroded, I, I feel like I did, and I think I've had several presidents, I think they tell, they'll tell you the same thing. I eroded the whole us and them dark side, you know, if you just give notice and bring them in early, sit down and have a conversation, you can get rid of a lot of problems. I've, I've had one grievance in eight and a half years, and it ended up favorable uh, to me. And even though it was favorable, we still sat down afterwards and impact bargain, if you will. Um, but I've had experience. I also took a, I have a master's degree, and it was one of my courses uh, where we got to do mock hearings. But I've taken part of grievances. Uh, I've written grievances. There's actually a proper way to write right grievances. It drives me nuts when unions just say, well, we want to agree with it. Well, okay, you got to tell me where in your contract, not just somewhere we think it's wrong. Where in your contract, article, what, did, what was the violation and what do you look to remedy? There's actually, you're supposed to have a component that actually looks to the remedy and what are you seeking. So a lot of times unions will just say, well, we want to agree with it. And um, select board member, members look at the chief and go, well, what's going on? To say, the grievance kind of panic. I don't know why. It, it's just somebody saying, hey, we disagree with and we want to sit down and get 
so I've had select boards who my grade was based on how many grievances I had. So if I get to the union what they want all the time, I'm going to keep my job. You know, but that was that select board. You know, um, so I. But to answer your question, I've gone through uh, grievances, arbitration, um, civil service. Because we're civil, you're not civil service anymore. But I know we are civil service. Um, I was just going to go through my first civil service hearing, uh, but it was withdrawn, and it was it's all I have to go through that hearing uh, for hiring processes. Um, but I follow uh, the rule, and uh, as I was, as uh, somebody in a hearing that I'm involved with right now just said, I document everything. She go document everything, um, and it's because on inspection, I want the document that I'm doing for a hearing to speak on its own, so that you don't have to go find a paper over here or what's the doc. I try to make my documents speak on their own, so that. If a third party comes in and wants to know well, what's going on. They're getting what, when, where, why, right in that document. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> I'm John Duvall. Um, what training and experience do you have in developing and implementing services and programs, courses, and or learning object objectives that incorporate diversity? So again, uh, we're all getting in, in the state training through the Mass Police Training Council. In addition, as you know, and I, I traveled with Chief Tarsa, uh, chiefs go to extra training every year now in September for a three-day conference. A lot of it is coming through there, um, as well as my two-year involvement with Multicultural Bridge and the Equity Inclusion. I was actually invited by uh, Ms. Van Zandt to join the Berkshire County race task force and I had gone to two meetings before COVID and, and uh, other things changed so um, as far as as far as uh, you know my training uh, it, it's really through MDTC and through my school district and then my work with the equity inclusion and race task force uh, developing programs um, that was a committee I, I, I was I was a little bit daunted that I was going to be put on that committee because if you deal with educators, um, they have a pretty, they have a set way, not a set way, they're used to doing education plans, let me say that. And to throw me in there, I, I was like, to write curriculum was a daunting task. And they said, we're going to use your community outreach. I was okay with that because in my community, I, I am that face where we're a small town and I grew up in Dolphin. I'm that face everyone's going to check with for a reality check or hey, we're hearing rumblings that we're having equity and inclusion and tell them what that mean. I actually should help sponsor a book read. Um, we had it at local businesses and Dalton, the Dalton CRA. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's huge for us in our town. And so I set up a book read there. I actually had the trifold. I felt like my kids, I had two teenage daughters. I felt like they were doing a book report. I had the trifold stand and print it out and, you know, Told what the reading was about. We had the Not in Our Town pledge there for people, and it was a book. Uh, it was a book read that we chose. Um, why are all black kids sitting uh, together in the cafeteria? And it, it's a great book. It's been a talking piece, uh, not only in our county but in the nation, and even more recently, it's been pointed to. It's a great book. Um, the school district published the or uh, purchased those, and we set them up at the senior center, um, as well as the CRA. And, I, and we were going to bring it across our seven town district, our, our school district as well. But I got to tell you, the seniors really latched onto it. Um, they they enjoyed that book being there and having it there. So um, those are those are things that you could do here is is just start uh, getting literature from people of color to share at book clubs and book reads. Uh, and the book I mentioned uh, is, is, a, is a good start. Um, but as far as curriculum, uh, I would, if I was here, uh, and I know Rick was trying to do it, I asked the Chiefs to see if we could have Gwendolyn and Stephanie Wright, her, her, uh, her uh, mm -hmm. assistant, she's wonderful. The lessons they do, they kind of ping pong off of one another, and they beat off each other, and you, you always learn. I, I went to every meeting and I always learned something. I actually paid out of my budget to have them come and teach uh, the officers in my school district. I, I went to the Berkshire Chiefs and asked last year if we could make it as part of our um, extra training outside of what was mandatory. It was opted to support the district attorneys and it was a great course. They had a two-minute one up here. 
Oh, it was in our test. Uh, two courses for domestic and sexual assault updates. And so they felt as though it was important to support the new district attorney and the curriculum was kind of, well, Rick was interested and he was thinking of doing the same thing I did. Uh, I invited the departments from all seven towns and we had, uh, I, I would say about 70% of the officers of all the towns in attendance at my, in my middle school and had a full day training. Uh, I, had, I had officers who were not going to be like, what is this about? And they came up at the end and thought it was great. One of them saw officers' faces and said, I'm not sure how this is going to go by the end of the day. Like the person she thought might be the troublemaker, so she said, oh, like, he, he offered so many good things. Or, you know, so it's, again, bringing in those things just that if you don't take the opportunity to have the discussion, uh, you're not going to get beyond your own uh, personal biases. We all have implicit biases, and people hear bias and you think that's a negative thing. No, it's just how you were raised. And unless you have the conversations to recognize what you're doing, you can't get beyond it and move on. Um, so as far as, you know, I know it sounded like it was more point curriculum, but Rick was looking at having her up here as well on his own. Uh, for the same thing, I don't know if that ever happened. I... Gwen Gwendolyn has uh, presented to our board yeah. about the um, the pledge. Yes, yeah, was Stephanie with? No, but uh, oh. Stephanie was actually a classmate of mine um, oh. in a public policy class yeah. over the last year. So very familiar with both of them. Well versed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Jeff, I'm going to ask you. Uh, to talk a little bit about your budgeting experience. Um, and just for frame of reference, the uh, police department's budget is $1.8 million of our roughly $16 million budget. So if you could um, identify and discuss your experience with budget, um, including any knowledge and skills <coughs> that you would bring. To my, my budget, just to give you an idea, it's, it's two pages. I saw your budget, uh, I, took a, I took a look at it. Uh, there's a couple things I looked at before I applied. I, it, I looked at the, uh, the patrolman's contract, patrol officer's contract. Um, that is really what dictates how you do things. It really is. It, it, everyone thinks it might be somewhere else, policy. You gotta follow the, 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 the contract. And it, it is very reasonable. It's actually a very good contract, I'm gonna tell you that. Uh, I don't want my officer, the officers and don't see it because it's a very good contract. Um, but I looked at that contract, I looked at the chief's contract to see, you know, what would be expected of the chief, and I, and I saw the budget, uh, or an example of your budget. Uh, it's similar to what I have. Uh, it looks like, uh, for, for the most part, it's two sheets. Um, ours is split into an Excel sheet, which I do. Um, I am 100% responsible for my budget and have been for eight and a half years. Nobody does it for me. The accountant doesn't do it for me. My administrative assistant doesn't do it for me. Um, I prepare. And I live by it. I, every every uh, usually six months, I will make sure I'm on track uh, because things happen. I know you guys are going through. You don't. I don't. I don't think you budget for losing people, having a backfill their ship, and send two or one or two people to academy, and that cost. So as soon as something like that happens, or an officer injury, a uh, military activation, I know my budget well enough. And it would take time to learn years. It, you know, it takes roughly a year to, to learn it, to know where it is. But I knew my budget well enough to know that we could weather one uh, of it. I call that a major event, having somebody leave in back mm -hmm. If I was uh, if I was thrifty, we could handle two. Uh, but anything more than that, I was going to be going and asking for more money. Uh, but my experience is well versed. Uh, I daily uh, or weekly conversations with my town accountant. She's wonderful. Uh, she, she's very particular on how things get done. Um, I think she had a resistance from Chief in the, in, in the past. Um, I, whatever she wanted done, I changed my method and I did it that way. I know how to fill in the spreadsheet uh, with the equations to round up or however you want to do it so that it's 40, you know, 40 hours times 52 weeks times the salary. And for your own review, you don't have to do the math you just to make sure my equation's correct. Um, it's split in under a salary component and then an expense. If I knew I was going over salary, I tried to, uh, I would not go on a spending spree and I try to bridge the gap I, by bringing money from expenses over. Um, if we needed equipment, I tried to find grants so that we could, you know, pay for equipment with grants so that we could print expense money over before I asked for uh, either an inter, inter department transfer by May, I think it is, or, you know, and then, uh, a, you know, special town because it's 
easier to do the interdepartmental transfer before you can go to the special town meeting. And um, I know the deadlines. I know when we can um, get you know best practices on three bids versus uh, have a have a hosting uh, for capital expenses or uh, services. Um, I have a contract that allows for the quality allowance like I see yours does. Um, we have reserve, we heavily rely on the reserves. We're, we're allowed to carry five reserves, and uh, we uh, tend to overuse them because some of these either have a military injury. Uh, we have quite, quite a few reserves that don't have full-time jobs because we're offering them enough between working and uh, details. I mean, they do details are making as much as I am. Uh, as chief, so uh, but I, I have very good knowledge. I, again, it was one of my college courses for my master's degree, uh, but eight and a half years of experience with it. Um, I've had to go ask for transfers and overages. I was doing well for the first uh, six years where I was kind of breaking even for an average. If I went over a year, I tried to save and return money uh, the next year so that I could always get into my finance committee. Uh, I just always, always. Well, first of all, they support the police department. They've always trusted me because they know I spend money like it's mine. You know, I you know, I don't just think about it. it's taxpayer dollars. I'm accountable to the taxpayers. I actually feel that that's my report card with my town. Now, how many grievances I have, I think my report card is, how do I do a budget if I go over what was reasonable? Did I, did I expect it? Did I communicate it early enough? Was my communication well? And fortunately, my finance committee and I did a lot. Thank you. I can't go long, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a lifelong resident of Adams, I have witnessed the evolution of our police department. I vividly remember the young man, the officers walking the streets and addressing you as you passed by. The nightly rounds, the stores to check on their security, the writing of tickets for expired parking meters. In short, the Adams police had a visible presence and you knew who they were. Times have changed. They always do. No longer do the town's police officers walk the beat. They drive their cruisers to accomplish their tasks. No longer do they check stores after closing. Instead, they shine a spotlight on the business facade and move on. No longer do they write parking tickets for meter violations. We needed to add a town position to make this transaction. I must admit that I cannot put a name to the face of all of our police officers. What is your taking? What is your take on policing, which I term resident friendly? Sure. Um, all of the, what you said is is true uh, in part. Not all the time. I don't like using the words all the time or, or never. Uh, in every community, in every town. Um, and first, I must protect the profession and your officers. We are being asked to do so much more than back in your, the times you're talking about when they did. We are being tasked with so much more uh, in the community uh, for a uh, wide space. Um, it's not just enforcement anymore. We have to, we have to do social work. We're dealing with uh, mental health issues. That's probably predominantly, and I'm sure your officers, it's got to be the same, the same, you know, where we are. Uh, they're dealing with things that take more time to get an outcome. Before, those quick tickets was a quick transaction. You could go on and be seen on, on Main Street or Park, Park Street, you know, uh, all day long writing tickets. And a lot of towns love that. I can see it. They're doing something. So just because you're not seeing officers doesn't mean they're not doing things well. However, it's our job to listen, whether it's a perceived uh, real, or uh, it's just a perception or it's reality that the officers are not out there. If there's an expression of, hey, we would like to see this, they just have to respond. Um, in, my, in my department, uh, it takes one citizen to call and complain about speeding, and there's going to be a cruiser on that street at least twice that week. It might not be every day. You know, there's certain side streets I get complaints on. I get a, I get complaints on side streets that are dead ends. Uh, and they're like, oh, they're flying. If I put an officer there, it's a waste of time. How many cars are, you know, it's just, it's going to be the, the five houses on that street that are going to work. And then no cars, and when they come home, you know, they're complaining about their neighbors. So uh, you have to pick and choose where you have the best 
uh, chance of, of getting that visibility. But I have three, and I, I've been quoted as from having these goals recently as well, um, and my officers are sick of hearing them. I have three goals, and they're very general. If you want to keep me happy, and you work for me, is think about work while you're at work. That sounds simple, but we all know that there's a lot of people that are distracted at work and not getting things done via Facebook, social media, who knows. Uh, back in the day, when you're talking about when they walked feet, uh, I knew officers that did their, their daily and weekly errands, like going to the bank or the mail post office while they're on duty. I, I, I'm not a fan of police officers doing anything other than thinking about work while at work, and you can do that by asking too much. What well, should I or could I be doing right? The second thing I preach is share the workload. You have two officers on the street. I have two officers on the, on the street. If something's, uh, if, if something's going on, even if it's inside the department, and it's a process and there's 10 steps, and you're watching your partner do step one and two and three and not ask you, should, and don't wait to ask for help. Hey, you need my help? You know what needs to be done. While I'm doing step one, you pick up step two else because we're going to clear it off our desk and now we can get out and be seen more. Also, if the big call comes in, we've kind of cleared our desk off for the small things. Uh, so you're always keeping up. So my, my second goal is uh, share the work. Third is be part of the solution, not the problem. Um, one of my best uh, qualities or my biggest strengths, I don't know if you're going to ask that, but is problem solving. Uh, and why I say that is, is one of my goals. I see too many people focus on the problem and restate the problem and restate the problem and restate the problem and people just keep on going like fucking chickens. So I, I, I find my strength and it's my job as a supervisor is to get everyone back together moving forward towards a solution. So I ask my officers, if something's broken, don't let me find it on my desk. Come to me and say, hey, the, the check engine light came on on this cruiser, but I brought it down to the service station that we have a contract with, and they've already checked it, and it says that this is what it needs, and I told them when my, because we have cruisers in rotation, so it has two days off every week. Um, on my two days off, I've scheduled an appointment, they gave me a quote, here you go. Well, how wonderful. There's like, you know, there's, there's dozens of problems, and I know you, you know, this in a day that, you know, you have all the agencies. I just have the one department. You have all the departments. Uh, dozens of problems that come up with it. I mean, that's really what our job is. It really is HR, human resource, and problem solving. And so what I what I gravitate to is getting people to have, pass, looking in the rearview mirror. Let's get to a solution and move forward. And by the way, that solution, and this is where I, I, I hope select boards uh, understand the policing, particularly with officers responding to call. It may not be the best solution, but it was the best option available to us, you know, uh, so as long as we're moving towards a solution, it's going to be better than where we are now, gang, so it's, yes, I know it's not uh, a full house, but we have the pair of aces, that's what we were dealt with, let's go with it, and it's a solution better than uh, where we were at, so, uh, kind of went off on that. <laughs> hey, the police chief interacts with members, oh, I'm no one here. Yeah. <laughs> and the Adams Police Department works closely with the Adams Fire Department, Adams Forest Wardens, EMS, Regional Emergency Management, and State Police, as well as community based organizations. What has made you an effective collaborator in your current or past jobs? Sure. Uh, and, and that idea of inclusion. Um, when, particularly with fire departments, police departments, there's always going to be that, you know, competition or, uh, you know, what are you doing on our call? Sam? This is a fire call. But when things happen, you're going to see, and, and I'm sure you see it here, we have we have one of the best fire departments going in golf. Uh, they, when stuff happens, they're there, and we all do our jobs. What happens in between, it's, it's nice as if everyone gets along, but what you're talking about is the collaboration, and I hope you're talking about collaboration when something's going on, when work's necessary. Um, I'm a chief who uh, will always ask, uh, for other agencies. Um, I, look, if there's other chiefs in the county over a period of time, and, and, and you may or may not know any of these that didn't feel as though the sheriff should do anything other than uh, operate the jail. I've never been there. Uh, this is before, uh, you know, our, our new uh, our Sheriff Bowler took over, but certainly now, 
because all of MEMA grants and, and FEMA grants are all for a collaborative effort. So if I put out a, a grant at this police department, we're not going to get it. But if we go to the sheriff, and the, the sheriff has all kinds of equipment. So why would you not want to reach out to the guy who has everything we're going to need if something happens? You got to, and, and I have a good relationship, and he's actually one of my references with the sheriff's department, but it's also the state police. Uh, I've never been one of those chiefs who gets upset that a uh, one or two uh, state police cars are on either Route 8 in Dalton, or oh my God, they're on a side street. What are they doing on a side street? Okay, there's plenty of it out there for everyone to work. Um, one of my reasonings for BLEC, which I got to, I'll take some of the credit, uh, along with Mike Lynn, the chief of Hitzfield. We were at a, we had met for chiefs in years. The fire department does as well. The fire chiefs just have that system, the ICS system, and they work together as, as in the county. We weren't doing that. And uh, Chair Fuller called us to the, the jail to have a meeting. And a little bit of room. It was the first time I'd seen this many chiefs, part-time chiefs, you know, small towns. And so I asked, uh, can we start this DLEC thing back up? And Mike Lynn and I kind of spearheaded it. And I, uh, I started out the president, but I thought he would be better. So I stepped down and became the secretary because he wasn't taking that and what I did is, after every meeting, I recognized that small town agencies with part time chiefs, you know, do a day job, usually a highway superintendent in South County. I like every highway superintendent out South County is like a part time chief. But I would email them, uh, even the chief partner in Cheshire, I would email them the minutes. If something an announcement was made or training, I was like, hey, here's the, every one of them reached out and said, this is, this is great. I had no idea what was going on in the county. That is happening so much more. Uh, often, and, and we were very much now we mirrored the fire, fire department. But I, I have relationships, I have people on, I have their cell phone numbers right here uh, for the people you know, surrounding your community as well as mine. We have a mutual aid agreement, I'm sure you signed it, I know you signed it, the DLAC mutual aid agreement that allows that to happen faster than uh, Chapter 40 Master of Law, Chapter 41, which is the mutual aid law where you had to kind of go through some red tape before you can have that happen. We've already signed it, so the red tape is taken care of. Uh, and, and just about every community in Birch uh, County is a member. Um, so the, the local municipalities, I have everyone on the they know my they know my name, I know them. Uh, the sheriff's department, we everyone knows each other. Um, and I would I would have to get to learn uh, and meet your fire department if I was appointed. But yeah, I mean that's that's what we do. We meet them, uh, I'm on, as part of my position, I'm on our uh, emergency management uh, committee. Uh, it is run by a retired chief, Dan Filio, um, and he's also on my traffic commission, uh, so he, he's still kind of my boss. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I work well with, uh, I am trained, uh, Rick, I think Rick was pretty fully certified too, because we trained a lot, of, taking a lot of trainings. But I'm ICS 100, 200, 300, 400. Um, I'm NIMS compliant beyond, well beyond. I took many, many courses out of board one day and just started taking courses. Um, I have more training than was required for the chief's position in Massachusetts for ICS and NIMS and emergency management. So if a fire, the fire side talks to me in those languages, I know what's going on. Um, I've requested equipment from the county sheriff, so I know it's there. Um, you know, so it's needed. Uh, we have, you have an agricultural fair, and I know you do uh, a, a, a special night downtown, but I think that's been moving, it's on the green, don't you? Yeah. Um, I know you have, and you have the Thunderbolt and the Rainbow. Um, you mentioned my, my sergeant. Uh, he, I gave it to him, but he, he, he got me addicted to it, is the uh, incident plans. And actually now, you, what we used to just have our own uh, management plan, uh, emergency management plan. Pro prior to these events, just in case anything happens, and we shared them with the fire department, emergency management, and all the contact numbers were there. We shared them with our police. So we have the Dalton, Dalton Carnival um, annually, and we would do it for that. And, you know, so any kind of event, we have a landing zone already in Portland. So if somebody has, anyone has to be in a command post. Um, and now we have the training and capability where all that is electronically through MEMA on websites. And so last. Dalton Carnival, I uploaded it on there, and it tells them, you say, during this week, this is our event, and it, it takes it from a, a, like a, across the state they're looking at, it puts it in a different color, so it's coming up, and they're seeing it, and 
you just have to remember when your event's done, you take it out so it goes it goes lower and they categorize them. So uh, yeah, there's collaboration going and, and, and I would continue to do that here. I would go meet your uh, emergency management director and uh, fire chief and, and see what we can do. Just as, as a follow up, my question is kind of a lot of uh, to see if you can play well with others. We've had in history emergency management director calls me and he'll have it in the fire department. And at the time, the chief refused to go to the fire department. And when it's held at the police station, the fire chief refused at the time, it's not the current, yeah. at the time, refused to go to the police department. So these meetings never really could get going because of individual pride, I guess you would say. Yeah, so um, I, I say this at my police department, but again, we don't have to, it's awfully nice if we get to be like each other, but we're not being paid to like each other, we're being paid to do a job. And so if you have an emergency management meeting and part of that's part of my responsibility, I don't, I don't care what the relationship is, that's what we're adult professionals, uh, to still show up and uh, put your best foot forward. And, and uh, again, you never know, the more time you sit at a table together, maybe you found out that you uh, had a grudge that was uh, in your own mind, maybe projection, if you will, uh, and, and, and you can get by it. But, um, you know, I, I will let you know that in Dalton, uh, we used to train a lot more uh, with the fire department. It has, it has changed, um, but I am at every meeting I have to be at, school emergency planning council, that's big thing here, and I know you guys do that here with the state police, uh, Troop Canada, we do the same thing, um, and I have more schools that I feel like I'm drilling every week, I'm like, ah, oh. well, even, my, even my kids say, oh my god, I can't do another drill, so, yeah, because um, we also, I go, I leave my jurisdiction, I can help other towns, but um, I do my, I fulfill my responsibilities, uh, I have an extreme work ethic, I, I don't like idle time. I will find work if I don't have work. Uh, that's why the policy thing is right up my alley. It's why there's not something right on my, on my table I started in the policy. So I have no problem reaching across uh, disciplines to come together and meet. Um, and it's kind of the problem I have going on in my police department is, is some of my officers weigh how much they get along with somebody at coffee at the coffee shop versus well, what are we actually going to do? You know, so they'll, they'll say, "Well, I like that person." Yeah, but we're trying to get, you know, there's too much coffee. You know, it's awfully nice that we can get. Like, oh, I don't have coffee with that person. I think, you know, you refuse to have coffee with me. That person has coffee with me. And it's like, no, let's get beyond this. You know, we're here to do a job. It's awfully nice that we can get along. We're here to do a job. So I, I don't hold grudges. Um, I have a four. Let's just keep moving forward. Things are going to happen. It's not always going to be pretty times. We're going to have ups and downs. You hire a chief not just for the good times, you hire for the bad times, and you got to kind of just move forward. Um, and then there may be a time where it, it, it's time for those department heads to move on, which is one of the reasons I'm here today. Uh, and thinking about regional and collaborative nature of the police chief position, what is your experience in working for the district attorney's office? So, um, I have good experience with both. Uh, I was much more involved with the last district attorney because, and I, well, let me explain. I say that because uh, during during his long tenure, I and that's actually where I met Mr. Green. Um, during his tenure, I worked for the task force in the building. So I have much, and I, and I ended up getting, uh, my, my time there increased. It started out one day a week to more and more until the time I was full time for an entire year. So I had uh, a lot of interaction with a lot of ADAs, um, senior staff, and the district attorney, uh, who was, gave me a recommendation to become chief. Um, since the new regime, I believe I'm uh, in the county, I think I've had uh, more contact and support with District Attorney Andrea Aaron than, than others. And I think she would agree with that. I've gone to press conferences on her behalf um, with the juvenile uh, diversion uh, program, and she asked me to speak. Uh, but that was, and 
and she also had the uh, the uh, domestic violence uh, read the book read. I read the book, and uh, she had a uh, night at the Colonial with the author, gave on a presentation, Officer, uh, our Chief Harsel went as well, uh, and we went together. Uh, so, um, you know, I, any initiative she puts on, I try to, uh, I try to get on board. I mean, she's one of the chief law enforcement officers in the county, and sets policy. Uh, I can tell you, not everyone liked the district, district attorney gave us the policy, but uh, we knew he, he ran the program. And so it doesn't surprise me that not everyone may agree with uh, Andrew Harrington's policies, but well, we have to buy them. I have good experiences with them, I have good communications with everyone. She, we, we called each other uh, on the phone and asked questions or uh, Thank you. The position of police chief requires a high degree of accountability. What does accountability mean to you in a legal sense with regard to data and metrics in terms of relations with the community? So, um, well, well, it threw me for a curve when you said data and metrics. It's kind of one of the things I'm going through right now in my time is accountability and using data and metrics to support uh, my initiative. And there's an objection to that initiative and whether it's correct or not. Uh, matter of fact, if you, uh, I, I had a hearing uh, at last Friday and it was the opening statement was being the police chief is going to checking off boxes and following the law. I, I get there's a personal side to it, and I'm going to bring in people that will show. Matter of fact, the select board uh, last night got 14 letters from 14 past employees uh, in the last 10 years uh, who said they left because they went to a full time position that we couldn't offer, or the state police or higher paying department that was higher paying and was not because of me, and that they, uh, all 14 of 14 letters in the last 10 years said that. They support my and my sergeant's leadership and training. Um, so I am about metrics. However, this is part of what I'm going through. You have to understand that numbers don't account for everything that's being done. So I'm about accountability. Uh, when I became sergeant, my department wanted me to be a sergeant because they said, now we're going to have accountability. And I laughed and I said, until it's with you. No, everyone likes it when the other person is being held accountable, but nobody likes to take their medicine. And I uh, believe in remediation, another popular term that's being used right now, rather than punishment. Uh, and if there is punishment, you better have your dots, uh, your eyes dotted and your T's crossed, because uh, there is a lot to be said about a union, a grievance procedure, and the choice of our well, we can ask those sort of arbitration. And the time to worry about it isn't after you've done it, it's before you start the process. And so I am about doing IMC, uh, it's changed names so many times, but I, I feel so Rick would probably, I'm sorry, Chief Darcy would probably be reverted to you by the old name of IMC. Mm -hmm. Is the data data advantage management system that you have is that what well, most of us in the county have? And it allows for an analysis. And I do those, but there's a time uh, where uh, you have to look beyond those, but there's a time that, yes, you have to hold accountable for those. And my, my reason for saying that is the, the default that uh, the stats that IMC prints is incident reports. It's a poor measurement because I had an officer who, for everything he went to, did an incident report because he was on midnights and he just wanted to show he was active. I'm not saying that's bad, but other people said, I'm not going to do a full incident report. The same information can be done in a daily log entry with an extended narrative. They both did the same thing. They both documented it. However, one got a stat. So incidents is a bogus stat. Then there's arrests. Well, I'm not saying you can't have proactive arrests. You certainly can. Uh, Officer Nick Levesque, I should say name. He goes out and he gets proactive arrests all day long in Asia. He's creating, but on midnight, 
How many cars? I, I'm certainly more come through Adams, but in Dalton, how many cars come through Dalton on midnight? Not many. So a cita an arrest or citation stat is not going to be nearly as much as where a commuter uh, town, Main Street, is bumper to bumper all day long. They're going to have more bites of the apple to do proactive activity. Whereas on midnight, it's really going to be reactive, but that reactive call is look more likely going to be very active and bad. It's going to be an active domestic, a bad car accident. You know, so the numbers are going to be lower. And so you have to keep that in mind. You can't compare midnights with days. Also, days, uh, certain people on days, like, uh, like the officer says, might be doing a lot more vehicle, while another officer is doing a lot of the, B, the, the larceny BD problems. That takes a lot of time. So we try to weigh what do the stats mean? Now, one of our faults that I'm finding in the, the hearing I'm going through now is we posted them at the beginning of a bi monthly annual review. We do a bi monthly annual, annual review because we also do yearly assessments. And we were told that during annual assessments, which is another data piece driven uh, bit of information for accountability. <clears throat> we do an annual assessment when uh, I took a course on how to give assessments. They said a pitfall is to only uh, touch base with your employee during your last, you know, the, the last annual assessment. And then give them and say, well, you weren't doing this. I said, well, what are you going to tell me? You told me I was correct. So I took that back and I said, as a sergeant, I said, why don't we do that? So why don't I do a bi-monthly report with numbers? which is a statistical driven of saying, hey, this is what your ship looked like. They know what it means. If there was zero arrests, well, there shouldn't be zero. I mean, I'm sure something was going on. If there was four on midnight for the bi monthly, okay. You know, that's, that's probably what the call by was. You can't doctor crime. Maybe you shouldn't be. It's, it's either, it'll either watch like a duck and box like a duck, and we should make an arrest, or we shouldn't be doing it. It's not walking and talking like a duck, just for the sake of a stat. So I believe in accountability, I believe in stats. They have their place in their time. Um, and it's what I'm going through right now. Uh, I'm being told that I uh, remediated based on uh, when, when a person had better arrest and citation stats than another person. And I look at activity. And it, for a long time, people, my, my own attorney said, ah, I get it now. Activity can be so much more than arrest. A citation. You do a building check. They have to do building checks every night. They have to log them. You will find that half the activity that midnight officers do on midnight shows and all are building entry checks. It's amazing how many doors they find and they and they can't just be visual. I went out and said, hey, what's what's a beat? Well that's visual. Wait, I'm doing a visual check. Do you, do we do we have buildings disappearing? I don't know. I mean like no, oh, that building's there. No, get out of the car, walk around the building and shake the door. And I want to see more being visible <laughs> than me. Now, I have written, written that saying to me that said, uh, we're having a cold snap, it's going to be below degree weather. Stay in your cars. I mean, it's just absurd to go out and do building checks. Uh, they do, the old regime, I was taught this, when you said they do with their spotlights, on commercial buildings, you can see the slide lock. I still like to get out and shake the door. So I, the old camera said, hey, look at this picture. Okay. All right, they did. you don't even have to get out of your car. You can just look at the, the deadbolt and you can see what the spot is. So that's, that's what they're doing. Um, but no, I, I say get out of your car. It's kind of this question that you just asked me, if, is if you've seen me in the paper, this is exactly what I'm going through. Is, should I have held a, an officer accountable? That officer saying I held, him, I held that, that officer accountable based on arrest and citations. Um, and I, I'll go further and answer this because it may come, come up in a question. I'm 100% with the, uh, I 100% I back my decision to remediate this officer three times. Two times in 2017, one time in 2018. We've had no problem in 2019 until that officer resigned to go to another agency. And it was clearly documented with uh, a prior notice to that officer, had their union representation there, clearly documented it correctly, including audio recording of the meeting so it can accurately be heard later, which no one has listened to those recordings yet. And um, it is clear that it was not about arrest and 
adaptations of this policy, a lack of activity and decision making on homes. Um, maybe a question that come also comes up later, but it fits right in because this is the heart of the matter of what I'm dealing with is weighing that accountability. I'm a big accountability person. Do you work well here at work? My last one is, as I said, I just said do work well or share the workload, uh, be part of the solution of the problem. Is what, when you can, if there's no calls, three activities, a minimum of three activities. Go out and do building search, serve a summons, check at a gas station. At closing time, we, we close early, we tell them that everything closes at 10. Go at closing time and just check on them while they're cashing out. They're going to look, and they, they do, they love it. And what we find out is building that relationship, going over on this question, building that relationship, they still call you and say, hey, I think so, I, something's going on. This guy's walking down Main Street, we're small town, I mean, Main Street. Mm -hmm. And so they'll start actually reporting stuff to you. And it goes back to your being seen, being heard. So just getting out of the car and, and an activity can be just having a community interaction. You can be washing the cruiser, you stocking the first aid kit. Um, it's exactly what I'm going through now, but it may look like something different. With the just follow up uh, with the chair, um, the situation you're in, do you feel that if there were more uh, direct policies and no procedures in your department that um, going through this process that you would be able to uh, refer back to them and that the board is left with these policy for adults. Yeah. But we'll be communicating with the board and, and tell the who you're following with the how policies and procedures. I so yeah. activ activity um really isn't gonna show up in a I mean it does show up in the rule of regulation as far as your uh uh <coughs> now you're really testing me here. Um response control control area or your uh what's it fall under. It is in there. Um, again, I didn't discipline. I remediated two years ago. There was, oh, let me say this. So after the union representation, I got no verbal complaint from officer or the union, no written complaint, and no grievance from remediation two and three years ago. So I don't, I didn't bring, I, I, I don't, I'd rather not discipline, I'd rather remediate and get, and that person in 2019 operated as they should. So I feel so my remediation work uh, when that person left they didn't like how I did things. So look, and, and according to the grievance procedure in the contract, it, you got five days. Um, I also have several officers coming in Friday in the second part of the year, including the union president, that are going to testify that I was clear why I was doing it, and that their own observations will back my reasoning. And, and prior to um, the situation that's going on, how did you keep the board of selectmen? I know you work for a top manager, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different than what we have here, but how do you keep, or how does the top manager keep the board of selectmen up to date on what's happening in the police department? You know, when you come to budget time, and, and, uh, you come uh, when the police department is looking for support from the board, the leaders in the community, how, did, how was the communication? How, you know, what are the measures metrics? Uh, discussed uh, uh, about here. Was there any communication with the board of selectors? So part of the reason we did the bi-monthly reports is in case we were asked. We were never asked. Um, I did attend, uh, I, I attended select board meetings when I was on the agenda. I, I had, again, my, my major interaction daily was with uh, my town manager. Um, he had department head meetings every month. And as part of that, he a long time ago requested that we do uh, a few bullet points of what we talk about so that he could share them with the select board. So I made it exactly that. Every month I said, this is what we completed. This is what's new, uh, good or bad, or what would, for budget, staffing, training, um, commendations. Uh, hey, these are some good cases that happen. I didn't get detailed investigate investigations because they're open and ongoing and they're in court. And it's just a big no-no to, to go in a public forum and talk about an open case. Um, the rule of thumb was uh, the chiefs or the police departments, when they had the ball, it's correct if I'm wrong. When we had the ball investigating, if we need, felt like we needed to reach out to the public and talk, we could. But once we kind of handed the ball off to the DA's office, and they didn't, the DA's office really wouldn't speak about it. It was kind of hard. But once we handed off the ball, we were supposed to shut up and leave it in the hands of the attorney's office. So, that's different on an ongoing case, and sometimes select boards, when it's a big case, they're like, hey, what's going on? That's the convenience of having the town administrator uh, and, and having the trust of him 
getting uh, some details to be able to satisfy your 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 knowledge. Um, I got a new case. I got actually I got uh, the select board gave me an award. Uh, in 2005, we had the biggest seizure of drugs, and uh, I, I just was lucky. But they wanted to acknowledge me, and the case was ongoing. And it, it, it really, we it really we just had gotten the arrest and filed the paperwork. It was really too new, and they wanted to do this public thing. I said, no, it's not the time to spike the ball and high five each other. We just started this. Like down the road, if you want to do my work, and so they did. They they honored my, and I was only. I was a chief, but you know, there's a time to kind of have that moment. But I would offer, like, I, we have a foundation system. Um, we didn't have this before I was chief. Um, when I was in the association, we didn't have foundation. So I made the officer a year of the year award, and it was an uh, association thing that we did every year. We nominated people, and what everyone recognized is we sat around like, at a table like this, all the officers, and we read nominations. But what they realized is that was actually the award day. It was a day for us to get around and actually say nice things about each other. People took time. Um, you know, John Bishop did an office. So we had an officer uh, that is no longer with us. He's in the private sector. He took time, even if he wasn't nominating somebody, just to say a snippet about everyone. He usually used comedy with it. And it really set the tone, so we let him go first. But, it, you know, somebody ended up winning the award. Well, when I took over, I copied... Um, there's really not, you don't have to read about the wheel. You can just, I can, I, you can have a good career just copying people. Uh, Northampton had a commendation system in their accredited. Uh, I, I cut and pasted, and so now people, when people get life saved or CPR, they get a pin in a, in a letter in their file. They get to wear the, you know, some people have so many pins, I only allow them to wear five because it just looks gaudy on their dress uniform. And they, so I give them a bit, it's a badge holder with five spots, and like, yo, they got more. You pick the five that mean the most to you, but we're not going to march it. The parade with you, <laughs> you know. But, you know, so I always updated them on those good things because again, he's going to hear bad all day long from every department, right? Who's the first? So I'm trying to include those good things as well. Good, thank you. Question. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, that actually ends our formal questions, um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, share with us anything that we may not have asked you, that you really wanted to make sure that we knew about you and your candidacy um, yeah, I, I, before I you guess, leave the room. We want to make sure you have a chance. Sure. I, I, I guess I just want to say that um, I greatly appreciate this opportunity. I, I know that my name is in the paper. Um, I am confident with my decision. Um, you all know that decisions need to be made. There's times where not everyone agrees with it. And uh, sometimes you just have to agree to disagree and move on. I love my community. I'm very happy with the relationships I've developed um, with seniors in the school district. Uh, a letter of support went from the school administrators to my school board. Um, you know, I, I get that uh, my, my media coverage uh, does raise questions. But what I want to say to you is, I'm more than just a chief. Um, I'm a father of two kids in, in, in high school. They both uh, want to go to college. And uh, I'm willing to take the risk uh, to recognize if a good thing has come to an end. Without, I, I feel as though I'm going to have a good outcome. Um, and, and I'm going to work towards that. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's why I went public. I went public with my hearing to show the community that trusts me that I feel like I'm getting a good decision. But I feel uh, my set down with my family, and I feel that uh, the risk is worthwhile uh, to try this interim, not just the full time. I did put in for the full time, but this interim. It's a risk. Um, but I, I think no matter what the outcome of this risk, uh, I've made a good choice. Now, uh, if you offer me the position, I would want to honor my contract. I respect my community, and, and, and I want to honor the contract with a 30-day notice. I would have to do 30 days. Um, so I would just want to let you know that. Um, I do not plan on just walking out. Um, and 
if, if I don't get this, I have a year left in my contract, then hopefully I, I will try again for a full time position. So I understand you guys have a tough situation with COVID and budget up here and uh, you know other other things on your plate. So I just wanted to leave you with that because if, if, if I don't get the offer, um, you'll see me again. <laughs> Uh, I just thought my family sat down and we talked and we thought it was worth for the risk uh, and because Adams did catch my eye. Um, I, 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 for some reason, Dalton and Adams Chiefs have gotten along. Uh, I don't know if you know John Bartels. He's a, he, was, he's, he was a selectman and now he's on a school committee, but he was a chief. He would ride with Chief Perot to the Chiefs meetings and they just got along. Chief Pro was part of my selection process for a sergeant, and boy was he tough. I scored a 92.5 and placed myself first at my department with a civil service test, and he still in that in that era or the interview was tough. Uh, he was part of my chief selection, so I when I got chosen with chief, we drove together, and then when he retired, uh, Rick and I drove. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm I'm kind of wondering who am I going to drive with, and uh, and then if I get this. Well, who will I be driving? You know, so, but anyways, uh, I just wanted to tell you that, uh, you know, I've talked a lot about being a chief. I wanted to give you a little bit of insight of who I am and why I'm here today at an interim position. Uh, I, I love Dalton. I, I never envisioned uh, I would leave. Uh, but sometimes you got to know when to say when for everyone. And, and that's why I'm here. Okay. So with that, do you have any questions of us? We have a few minutes. I, 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 I don't. Um, other than if I leave, I don't have health insurance. You know what I mean? Is that a two more thing? Is it part of this position? That hasn't really been discussed yet. Uh, I don't think it was contemplated yeah. for an interim position, but that can be discussed uh, with the select board in terms of a contract. Okay. And then. Um, so I did share with you when we spoke on Monday about uh, kind of an aggressive timeline that we're looking at to honor uh, Chief Tarsus' uh, retirement of a mid-July date. Uh, and you did share with me the 30 days uh, notice that you would need to be given. So we, we are looking at, and Chief Tarsa has agreed to um, be available past his retirement date if needed. Um, so we do appreciate that. But we are looking to, um, Finish up interviews this week. So we're interviewing tonight, uh, tomorrow, and Friday night, um, and hopefully uh, discussing this next week, being in touch with each of the candidates uh, as early as next week. So I think that's kind of where we're at uh, with the process. I know you have my contact information and you have Jay's contact information if there are any questions that should come up um, before we do contact you. Um, but I don't know if there was anything else from anyone, but we ended right on time. I'm very proud well, of all of you. Wow. Yeah. It sounded like I was long-winded. You're supposed to. We're trying to get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, Jeff, we'll let you get on with your evening. Great. We're just going to probably wrap up our meeting here. It's uh, very nice to meet you. Right. We were not in COVID time, but shake your hands and and thank, thank you, you for being here. Nice thank you. All right. So there isn't really anything else from before us. Um, what I will do is I will take the question sheet that uh, we used and I will put them in the order um, that we actually ran through them tonight and put copies in each of your mailbox for tomorrow night. So we do have um, two more candidates tomorrow evening. Tomorrow is I want to say five thirty meeting time and a six o'clock interview. Does that seem right? Let me see. I just know the year five thirty now. I know. I was like, well, if there's any, um, I have to see. We were trying to um, cover any license items that came up now and then. What is tomorrow the third or eleventh? Sorry, five thirty meeting. Um, and it's a reopening of parks. 
is the only thing that's on there in case there was an update or just some information to, to talk about because it was something that John had mentioned to have a discussion about. So I did put it on the Thursday agenda. But so 5.30 starts with the first interview is at 6. But if that person shows up early, we can always start a little early with that. Okay. I wonder if we're going to get through the first one. Oh, good, okay. But hey, we're still recording at the moment. So, if there's nothing else to come before us this evening, if someone would like to make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Jim. And John? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deb and Ed, for uh, hanging on.